So what's up, Josh? Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm stoked that we're finally doing this. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah, it very man. much. No, this is, as we said before, this has been like a real tough year to do this, obviously. Definitely. And I'm so stoked that uh, you took the time to come up here and, <laughs> Thanks for having and me. do this. Yeah, this is great. This is awesome, actually. It's cool to be in somebody's creative space, you know? I think it's it just it, it, it gives you an inside peek at kind of how their brains work. So it's it's nice to be able to see see how it all comes together well like you were just saying you know anyone who watches the podcast doesn't know what's like behind yeah, the camera it's a and mystery it's, like, it's great and it's like I'll kind never, of a small bedroom but it's the recording studio too i'll never tell this is crazy Ten thousand square feet wow this is quite yeah spread. <laughs> i wish yeah yeah maybe hopefully in the future that'd be fantastic yeah this is great with a production team behind a you know in a studio for sure and... <laughs> yeah hey mike yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and have like some tv screen behind us that could be bringing up stuff that we're talking about absolutely yeah or imposing cue the, it on the screen the video oh yeah that must be nice i always thought it'd be cool i saw this movie once and i think it was called don't say a word it had um she was in clueless Brittany murphy i think was her name she passed away yeah okay and it had michael douglas if i remember correctly do you know this movie it sounds familiar, but I don't think I've seen it. So I think like probably is early eighties where the dad, her father is, uh, seems to be pretty good at living a criminal lifestyle <laughs> and he's part of like some kind of jewel heist of some sorts. And you know, he's mixed up. It, they kind of present like it, the movie comes in hot that, you know, the running from the cops, the, all these people's stuff's going on. And, um, maybe they allude you to believe that he's like, Hmm. Maybe he's like the best of the criminals, like like the nicest guy of them. You know, he just maybe he got wrapped up into a life that he didn't quite anticipate. But moving forward, so he, uh, I don't want to give this away, but this is the setup of the movie. So I think like they get caught. One guy falls off the roof. Maybe someone else pushes him. And then one guy like disappears from the cops. And then the his, Brittany Murphy's dad, like I think he ends up with the jewel. This is like the very beginning of the movie. And he like, he like, he hides it somewhere. And so I don't think they show the daughter because some reason, of course, like in the middle of this, he ends up with his daughter somehow or makes it home before something bad happens to him. But he like hides this jewel and come to find out uh, the other guy 20 years later or whatever is getting out of prison. And, you know, Brittany Murphy, she has this daughter. She grows up. She doesn't realize um, any of that stuff at all. These are distant memories. She's only like three, four years old. And they, the, the guy wants to find the jewel. And so I think it comes like to look for her. She's in imminent danger. Nobody knows. But somehow I think they get Michael Douglas, who's like this like therapist, psychologist to somehow work with them. Or I don't remember the whole deal. And I apologize if anybody's <laughs> like, listening to this, like this dude it? does not know what he's talking about. <laughs> but the cool part is, is that they're using like this like psychotherapy or to, to they, they put her under um, uh, not a trance. What do you call it? Like anesthesia? A, no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> a hip, hypnotism. But, oh, yeah, and they yeah, hypnotize yeah. her yeah. And, and they're working back through her trauma, but she sees it and it's almost like having a videotape of a moment in your life, pausing, stopping, rewinding, yeah, yeah, fast yeah. forward. And there's many things in my life that probably more that I forgot than I remember, but I was like, man, if your brain was like a hard drive, it would be cool if you could just kind of go in, tap that day, tap that time, because you know you were there. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. like, it, and it could be something you didn't think about for years, months, days, decades. And somebody goes, oh, remember that? And you go, oh, man, I totally forgot all about that, right? Yeah. And then poof, you're thinking about the sun, the smell, the leaves, the trees, all this stuff, and a, a, this memory can come back to you. And I always thought it'd be cool to be able to just like click of like a button and be able to do that. So I said that to the guys at the shop once. And I was saying to James at the shop, I go, Yo, wouldn't that be cool if you could just like at any point like dive into like your memory or your consciousness or whatever? He goes, no, that'd be terrible. I go, why? He goes, <laughs> dude, think about all the terrible things that have happened in your life and the fact that like you've made it to be an adult to suppress all of those like dude, painful, <laughs> yeah, exactly. terrible things. And then now they're just there at any moment in time. Like he's like, no, he's like, dude, being able to bury that stuff and like be resilient and move forward. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess you got a good point. Who said that, James? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I could see James saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah, he's like, no, you just need to crush all, crush all that pain, put it away. Yeah, and then like, yeah, I could, I can, I can see and hear him saying that too. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because he's deep. You know, like he'll, he'll like, oh yeah, he'll analyze things with you for sure. Um, have you seen Minority Report? Tom, uh, Tom I just Cruise? rewatched it for the first. I watched it during quarantine when so, we were closed. It's not like you can. 
it's not like you yourself can do that, but I, the, the precognitive, yeah, like the, being able to see a murder happen before it happened. They roll like the, the three sisters in the, like the hot tub, roll yes. the marbles out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and then, but it they com- can watch it. They can like watch the murder happen before it happens. And so they, they, like Tom Cruise, they go and they grab, they, they arrest the people the before pre, the, the pre criminal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yep. that's pretty crazy because, uh, it's not really what you're talking about because we're talking about the past. No, but, but it, and that was looking into the future. Yeah. Well, I mean, so. Well, have you seen Black Mirror? Did you watch any of those? <laughs> Dude. I watched the first episode of the first series. Oh, no, no. That, no, no, and no. I was That's like, so bad. Yo. That's so dark. That one's not. No, and, I didn't even finish that episode. I and, and To be honest. Well, I can tell you it doesn't end great. I know. Well, I ended up finishing it, but it, it, it. So the first one I watched was actually, I think the first episode of the second season. It was the Star Trek one where the dude had like a, he had like an alternate, um, life in like a video game but it was like a star trek video game and it, he if you took somebody's dna yeah he could he could clone that person inside the video game but that clone thought it was the real person because it was a real clone but it was a digital version of themselves and they were trapped inside this video game and they had to do like it was like his fantasy so it's kind world. of like like an avatar meets like um, yeah like but living vicariously like a sims world kind of thing well and i guess without spoiling too much have you seen the prestige so there's two magic movies and I always confuse them, but I've seen both. Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale. Yes. So if you know what I'm talking about there, the cloning aspect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like so they each clone thought they were the person that was being cloned. You know what I mean? Like and, and so this so that was the first sure. one I ever watched. And that was like real dark because this guy had a crush on this girl at his work and was able to get like her DNA off like her coffee cup that she threw in the garbage and like cloned her into Oof. the video game. Without her permission? Yes. Dude. But she <laughs> thought it was her. Like the clone, like the real right. girl continues to exist. Sure. But the clone is now trapped in this video game where she's like in this perpetual role play yeah. thing. And like, and he's like the captain of the ship and he comes. And so she was somehow able, spoiler alert, <sighs> somehow able to get in touch with her, trying to, with the real and the real girl, I've got goosebumps talking about this. <laughs> the real girl makes an actual effort in the real world to get her out of digitized the, out of the video, to save her virtually. That's crazy. It's so crazy. There was something almost like that with Ethan Hawke, I think maybe, or where like people had, like rich people had made like a clone of themselves and they were down in this like uh, yes. world. And so they're living in this like same thing. They get up every day. They're in their pods. They have their job. They're doing their thing. They have the social like, circles. Like the Alexis? Or, or you- and then all of a sudden they go like, they're like calling Mark to the front. Like, dude, so like Mark walks down out of the factory. Boom. He gets beamed up this thing. They're like, no way. Like he's going to the equivalent of like Disneyland. They don't know where he's going. Oh, like, he's that's getting right. called up yes, the majors. Yes, that's right. But what For they don't organs. know is, yes, yes, dude, it's like oh, rich gosh. people that are yes. harvesting. They're clones. They're clones for their If they organs. get sick or what. Yep. Yeah. And then they like... <laughs> Then they like get out, like some people like get out. Yes. That one, yes. And oh it gets wild. God. I gotta rewatch some of those. And then you got things like Multiplicity, which was a comedy with Michael Keaton. Yeah. Like he's like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, man, yeah. Uh, I need to be a, a confident worker. I need to be a confident father. I need to be a reliable um, husband or whatever. I have work to do around the house. I have this that. So he ends up making these clones, and they get worse and worse right, as each time right. goes on. And uh, it just goes to show that, you know, same thing. It, it, it doesn't. It shows like the dark end of like these like fantastic yeah, ideas. Yeah, because you think it's going to be just have. a version of self. But like you said, these people, they, they develop their own sense of. Yeah. Yeah. An entity of the form of themselves. Well, or, yeah. And I brought Black Mirror up simply because of that one episode when we're talking about like being able to freeze time or like look back on memories as like a file on a computer was that one. Oh, man, I can't remember the name of the episode, but it was it was where they had the little handheld shuffle looked like a little iPod shuffle and the, the lens of their eye was the screen and they could, they could go back and revisit memories as if they were slideshows. And this guy had like, but the, the problem was, or the, the, not the problem, the problem for the wrong person was the authorities could plug in and, also and, see. And, and there was there was like a murder or something. I can't remember. It's it, this was one of the first episodes I watched as well. But something happened, and this guy couldn't remember what happened. And they like plugged into his hard drive yeah. basically, and they were able to f- cycle through. Like, and he was trying to remember what you know how he committed this murder or something. And and so that was you know the each Black Mirror episode was directed by somebody different. Okay. So it, it was all produced by the same guy, but each episode was directed by somebody different. Like um, the one where the woman loses her child. 
at the playground and freaks out and then has like she like low jacks her child basically has like that that sensor like, thing put like in like find my phone kind of thing yeah and so the so the but the, it went it went one step farther like the girl couldn't see blood so like if somebody had gotten hurt on the playground okay. it was like all blurred out like she like it was like this receptive like filter yeah and so she wouldn't actually be able to see like traumatizing things like her mom got like over security yeah, yeah. Or, or like paid for the extra package yeah well it was like this it was like this like experimental thing and the girl grows up to be like completely messed up and then obviously dives into drug use and like because she's because was like completely sheltered her whole life but that one was directed by um oh, why am i spacing her name taxi driver jody foster oh yeah so J jody foster uh directed that one but this the the producer i forgot who it was the guy who did black mirror the whole deal um, was scheduled to put out the new season of Black Mirror in 2020. Okay. And they decided not to because his words were 2020 it, is already a season of Black Mirror. Dude. <laughs> like, dude, so they, but that's real. They didn't Highest release. Ratings. They didn't release. Yeah. They didn't release the new season of Black Mirror because 2020 was already turning into a season of Black Mirror. I mean, <laughs> you watch those things and, and, and it's, what, what, what was the whole, uh, they used to say uh, art imitates life, but, I think life is imitating art in many it's ways. It's starting to. Well, Definitely. look at look at the the progress of I don't know if you were really into like Star Wars or Star Trek as a kid. Star Wars. So, yeah. I was into both. I was inadvertently exposed to Star Trek cuz that was just what That's was on. That's rare. Was that I don't think most people are both, are they? No. Well, as far as an enthusiast. Like I don't have Star Trek and Star Wars memorabilia. You know, I don't like live like as an enthusiast through those okay. realms, but as a child Star Trek was always on at like 7.30 p.m. in my house after did, dinner. Did your like, dad like it? Yeah, but it was just like... Did he grow up on it? No. No, probably not. I think it was just in my house, it was just... There were like certain TV shows that were just on... That were like kid-friendly for the most part. That were just like on after dinner. And they just... It was just on for the sake of the TV being on. Like my dad... Yeah. My dad wasn't like, you know, because he'd be out back in the shop half the time, but he like wasn't like Star Trek was like, okay for my sister and I to watch. Yeah. So it was just on. And I liked it as a kid, but I didn't grow up to be like, I don't have like Star Trek like stuff, I guess. But, but that show, like Steve Jobs, like it's so crazy. Like, so that show in the, in the eighties, like when next generation started with, yeah. uh, with Patrick Stewart mm -hmm. as the captain. The next generation, he had like these tablets. You know, this is like in the eighties, early nineties. Oh yeah. And he'd they'd have these little like, like thin iPad, looking like, iPad yeah. long before the iPad. Yeah. But now the iPad exists. And and it's so you're right. Like basically Gene Roddenberry, you know, the producer of Star Trek and his team were mm -hmm. trying to think of futuristic looking things, like, okay, so what if rather than like this cumbersome tandy computer with like this deep monitor and these big clunky archaic keys he's got this real streamlined it's like it's a screen yeah. but he can touch the screen yeah, yeah and and so they they made a prop and they through cgi or whatever they made it look like an actual element that was around in the 24th century whenever star trek was and now we're living in 2020 we've, yeah but even for the time for like when did that come out the 90s yeah early 90s so i mean yeah. even even think about I don't know what, what year the, the iPhone come out, like 2010? Seven. Seven? 2007. So, I mean, they're still pretty far ahead of... Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, it's insane. Even just to dream that up and have that actually be a thing that... In 20 years. Function, yeah. Yeah. Pretty wild. And so, yeah, we are ultimately emulating art in a way. It's so crazy because look at what... Oh, my goodness. I've listened to a couple of the of uh, Elon Musk's podcast when yeah. he was on Joe Rogan's, and it was like... His company Neuralink is like mega scary. Like they're they're working on a chip that they're going to be able to put. They're going to hook into the fibers of your brain. Like they're actually going to take wires okay. and be able to hook them into like whatever like the conscience like, of it, like whatever you're in your brain. Yeah. yeah. And first, and this is what's so crazy. Not that Elon Musk is like some evil genius, but everything starts with a good intention. Sure. Like right now, the point of them doing all this stuff, or what it'll, what it'll get utilized for at the beginning is curing things like blindness and like working on like Alzheimer's issues and stuff that in there, he's confident when he speaks about this stuff that they'll be able to plug into this, in this chip into your brain. And then they'll be able to like through Bluetooth, like, you know, maintain the chip or tell the chip to do certain things and they'll be able to work on it. Like you, you're plugging a car in yeah. and it'd be like, like a diagnostic, like you'd be able to fix things in the brain. 
and the amount of the amount of cognitive control the brain has over the body is like everything. So they're saying that they'll be able to ultimately cure like quadriplegics and yeah, people who are blind or are Alzheimer's or dementia. And but then then you get into the utilitarian aspect of it to where and he he put it he he said it pretty good where I, don't know, I guess I don't know where my phone is. It's over there. But anyway, we are people are scared of this whole idea of being a walking cyborg, right? So like that you've got all this the idea would be to the utilitarian aspect of it would be to cut bandwidth down to where you could actually like think of a question and rather than typing it in on Wikipedia, sure. you could it, you just but, got Google in your mind. And you know what the crazy thing is is like he said, he goes, We're cyborgs now. We're you're walking around with it in your pocket. Yeah. And you can hold it in your hand. And that's when it got scary for me. I'm like, oh, yeah, we are walking cyborgs now. Because you've got almost all the information you need to know in your pocket, on your person. Yeah. I mean, so crazy. Well, so think about telling somebody, like even like when my father grew up in a little farm town, they shared a telephone line on the road. So like me, you, three other people, we could all live on like this one section of road. And when the phone rings, it oh, rings in all of our houses. Yeah. But then I'd be, I'd be like, I'd pick it up and I'd go, no, nah, John, this is for me. And you get off the phone. In a different house. <laughs> yeah. So crazy. And then, so then to think that at one point in time, then you could have a phone in your house, have your own line, have multiple lines, have call waiting, mm -hmm. then have a cellular phone and then using digital waves or satellite. Yeah, or in the way. house. Now you had a cordless phone in the house. You could like sure. be in another room. Yeah. And yeah, then, and then go to a cell phone. Then go to phone. a cell phone. And then now essentially they are computers, you know, like, Oh yeah, the, you know they 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 do photos, they do video, they do music, they do anything that you want. In fact, they probably get used the least amount for talking on the phone. Exactly, oh, which absolutely. is interesting. Yeah, because the ways to communicate are much easier now than they ever have been. But people get disconnected by having more opportunities to connect with people. It's really strange, you know. Yeah, it's it's so crazy how far we've come in the last thirty years. I mean. I'm 35, I was born in 85. So that was at the beginning of more people having like car phones in their car mm -hmm. and stuff. And like, you know, cellular phones that were obviously the brick phones. But yeah, so in my lifespan, our lifespans has just been unbelievable. Yeah, I, <laughs> like, I think I was, I was somewhere, somewhere in my 20s before I got my first cell phone. Yeah, I wasn't too far behind you because yeah. I was, I graduated high school in 2003. That fall, my best friend from school who also rode BMX, we hit the road in November and drove every corner of the United States. He had a sister in Durango, Colorado, and a brother up in Bellingham, Washington on the on the Canadian border. And those were our two like main destinations. But we took our bikes and we just drove e everywhere. Yeah. I mean, just absolutely everywhere. Salt Lake City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Phoenix, Boise, Idaho, Portland, Oregon, down through Sacramento, Reno, Nevada, like we went everywhere and I didn't have a cell phone. He had a cell phone, he had a little like flip phone, but we were using an atlas, like an actual map atlas. And I was calling my girlfriend at the time and my parents each night from pay phones. Yeah, prepaid cards, right? Like not even, I was putting quarters in pay phones. Yeah. And 2003 wasn't that long ago, but that was when there were still pay phones everywhere. Yeah. I didn't have a cell phone. So for, same thing first, when I got out of high school, my buddy and I, we bought a 77 Dodge B100 custom van that had Aerosmith airbrushed on this thing. <laughs> on the <laughs> side? On the outside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So it was on the back right door panel. It was sweet. It was off like the first record. There's like a character. So if you've cool. Seen the record, you know it. This thing was this thing was a 70s show van. And I don't remember where we came across. I think it was down in Route 3A in Bo, just outside of Concord. And it ended up in the back of a parking lot. I drove by it. And you couldn't miss this thing. It was beautiful. It was like turquoise, aqua, marine color. <laughs> And yeah. so I pulled in and the guy was like, oh, yeah, this thing just came in. Um, it, they have all these like used car lots out there. And uh, he's like, yeah, this older couple is sat in the garage of their house for like, oh, that was 98. So like 20 years. And their son, dude, like played like in like a, like a hard rock and roll band, um, died in a vehicular uh, accident, oh, not with no. that van. Right. And, but this was like his pride and joy. I mean, every single thing from the inside to the outside, dude, to the Craig or to the, like, you name it. Like oh, it yeah. Was, it was a Chevy. Yeah. And so I think he, you know, must have given him like six, seven hundred bucks for it. I don't even know. And they bought something. And so it was just sitting in the back corner of his parking lot. And I drove by, I saw it. I was like, hey, what's up with that thing? He's like, oh. And you're this? probably the first person to be like, Stoked. I want that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I go, hey, listen, uh, I'm super interested. I'm going to be like taking off uh, forever living in a van. Uh, I want Down to buy this. River. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, so 
uh, can I take that to my mechanic, have him go through it, and uh, you know, if it checks out, I'll buy it. He goes, yeah, sure, I'll get, you know, okay, yeah. And so I brought it to my mechanic at the time, and uh, he's like, man, this thing is perfect. It is That's sweet. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, it had a three speed on the floor. That one was um, it a manual? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, of course, you wanted to put the price up once I came back, and I was like, yeah, let's go, let's do this thing. This yeah, because as a kid, you yeah. you didn't have your wits about no. you. No. Yeah. He, he's like, oh, I think the price just went up. I was like, no way. Yeah. But same thing. We drove all like we did like thirty something five states. This but, was right out of high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I yeah. think we did like. 35 38 states but we same was, thing we used pay phones for everything yeah and but there was like um you could get prepaid cards yeah, yeah you could yeah. get like yep. you could get a card where like somehow you could link it in with somebody's like phone account like to their like their home right line service. So yeah so i don't remember we had all sorts of like you know little like scam ways to like make phone calls and stuff like that but we would, yeah, like, you know, once every week or two, you make a phone call back to the East and yep. say what's up. And I'm check still alive. It. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. So was that the year you graduated high school? 98. Yeah. But you went out on this trip the year you graduated high school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's crazy because well, I, yeah. I did the same exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. So when 97, the, yeah, the fall of 97, uh, me and my other buddy, we were like, we're ready to go. We don't, yep. we don't care yep. what happens this year. Then in fact, I just found... I didn't, yeah. My wife and I were going through just a bunch of stuff, cleaning out the house. And she's like, what's this? And I was like, I don't know. And I opened this folder and it was a, um, it was a sheet of paper to um, drop out of high school. And it, yeah. And so at some point I, I, I grabbed that. I, I, I ended up making it through, which is a different story. Yeah. The skin of my. Um, but, similar story for oh, me dude, too. <laughs> yeah. But I found the sheet and I, I was just like, oh, wow. Like I was, I was so confident that I knew that like school and like, uh, um, you know, post-education, little in the education I was living in, I just, it was just cut from a different cloth. And so I didn't yep. understand like the value of it, but we were like ready to go. So like, we was just counting down, saving money, working as many jobs and hours as we could just so we could take off because we wanted yep. that freedom. Like, yep. I, you know, that'd be cheesy, but like, I want to get an education on the road. I wanted to like just learn exactly. stuff, you know? Yep. And I, it, that, that first few months of just driving all across the United States was like, it was exciting. It was terrifying. It was, I mean, learned so many things that, I mean, it'd almost be cool if it was like a required thing for like yeah. kids getting out of high school. Like, okay, it's here's the world before school starts in September, you're required to take like a cross country trip to like, right. just to like test yourself. Cause you're going to be living in, you're going to be dealing with people that you don't know. You're going to be like dealing with different types of places, how people communicate, how they act, how they observe you. Like how um, there's just so many things that when you're out of your ecosystem, your environment that are essentially can become very uncomfortable, but that's how right. you learn yep. that, that ability to like um, how you maneuver and operate and how you get by and how you, you learn a lot of lessons. Sometimes they're easy. Sometimes they're hard, but you driving across country and traveling and like, like you said, those things of not having in a way, I don't know, like sounds weird, but like I wasn't like itching to make phone calls and call people. I wasn't right. interested. Same. At, yeah. I didn't have, it wasn't like reporting stuff or putting, it's not like now, like putting your life online. And this is all cool. I think in return, like now we can communicate with people from all over the world much easier, but at the same time, you're so in the moment that, you, it's not even like I wasn't concerned with reporting back or telling everything. Yeah, that you were doing. experiencing just, it one hundred percent. Just it was, so. Yeah. yeah, I was the same because it's it's bizarre. I didn't know. I knew that you, you know, I know you well enough now to where I know that you've traveled abroad a bunch, and you know, we, we both kind of kind of exist on that same wavelength of like uh, a hint, if not a sharp dose of wanderlust. You know, like I'm always sure. trying to like go places, but but I, it was the same deal. Like I was. The only reason why I finished high school is because my parents were like, you're finishing high school. Like you're, because all I wanted to do is either be outside, be on my bike, writing music. Like I, I didn't like school. It, and I was that typical scenario of, I just didn't apply myself. Definitely. And, I, and my, my parents knew I was smart and my teachers may have as well. I mean, they only got that image of me at school sure. trying to like, and I wasn't a troublemaker. I was just always, my head was always somewhere else. And so same deal when we graduated, my friend Pat, who I, just the year prior, it was like my junior year of high school is when we started riding BMX. It was because Blue Torch was on in the afternoon on TV. What's that? Surfing, skating, BMX. It was like a, I can't remember if it was ESPN or TNT or some TV station. 
had um like a show called Blue Torch. Okay. And it was like from three to four PM on weekdays. So when you get out of school, it was it, they always played extreme sports. So you'd, you'd see X Games coverage from like the year prior. It was like reruns of like skateboarding or uh, surfing or BMX, and they always had like a half hour or fifteen minute segment of like old BMX videos. And both Pat and I, we had bikes, and we we're like, we got so stoked just watching that every day. We're like, we got to ride. So by our senior year, we were like deep in it. And I mean, I've got VHS tapes of like BMX movies like videos i made of like our crew and like edited them with two vcrs and a cd player and like no computer and like i've got full-blown like production videos because I was, I was all about it and so when i graduated like you said by the skin of your teeth basically yeah. pat was kind of the same we were just itching for june we're like well, let's just we got to get out of here and so by that summer we had saved up some money and that november was like we we're hitting the road same kind of deal we hit the road and it was his sister in Durango and his brother in Bellingham. Everywhere else, we had no idea what we were going to do. We were in an extended cab Toyota Tacoma with a cap on it. And, you know, our bags, like I said, I didn't even have a cell phone. Luckily, Pat had a flip phone if, like, we were stranded, broke down in the middle of nowhere in Utah or something. Yep. We could actually call somebody. But, yeah, I was calling my folks and my girlfriend at the time, my high school sweetheart of sorts, to just be like, hey, we're here <laughs> now. We're in, like, Nevada. Yeah. And I'm, like, alive. But... Yeah, like, but I brought, I brought a Sony Handycam, like a Hi8 tape Handycam, because yep. I was all about videotaping stuff yeah. like that, and I videoed everything. So it's crazy that even today I've got like video evidence That's of cool. like that whole trip. But like you said, it, it like, we drove into Boise. So basically, when we left Durango, we were headed for Portland, Oregon. Basically, we had friends there. We were gonna stay there, but we wanted to ride in Salt Lake City, and we wanted to ride in Boise. So in Salt Lake City, we ended up sleeping in the truck that night. And then in Boise, we hit a couple amazing skate parks in Boise and just went to a local skate park and there's a bunch of riders there. And we just introduced ourselves and like, oh, where are you from? We're like, New Hampshire. We're just out here, like just riding. Yeah. And, and they're like, so where are you guys staying? Like, I don't know, we might just stay in the parking lot in the truck. And like, no, come come to our place. And we're like, okay. So we started this crazy couch surfing thing. Both Pat and I were like able-bodied 18 year olds, but we I had pretty good judge of character too. Sure. We weren't getting ourselves into like real sketchy scenarios because we weren't like doing drugs and like getting involved in like weird people. But <laughs> we met so many people that like it did. It changed my life. Like we got into we got into Portland and headed south after coming down out of Bellingham and Seattle. We stayed in Eugene, Oregon for three full days because we met this guy Mike Lund, who was a pro rider at the time, at the Eugene skate park, just a big concrete skate park. And same deal. Where are you guys stand? Like, well. We don't know. Like we gotta we gotta pick up a friend in Reno next week before we head home. He's like, Oh, you're more than welcome to crash with me if you want. We're like, Yeah, this is awesome. Cause I had actually I knew who Mike Lund was. So I was like, Wow, this is amazing. We get to crash with Mike Lund for a day or two. The next three days, it poured the Oregon weather. Just poured for four days. Or the forecast was looking like it was gonna rain that far out. And we were like, I don't know, maybe we'll just hit the road. And Mike goes, Mike built houses, like he was a he worked in construction. He goes, Well, actually, I've been meaning to build a quarter pipe in my garage for like the last year now and I haven't gotten to it. If you guys want to stick around for a few days since the weather's going to be crap, you can we can build this quarter wow. pipe and ride in the garage. So we were like, yeah, let's do this. So we stayed at my, this dude Mike's house who we hadn't ever met in person. He didn't know us from a hole in the wall. And a bunch of his friends would come over every day and we would we built this like four foot like vert quarter, small vert quarter in this like two bay garage inside. And with the doors closed, we accessed the quarter from inside. It's not like you rode in from outside. Like the doors are closed. And and I videotaped this whole thing. I videotaped us building this quarter pipe and us riding. So I've got cool. all that footage Very still. Cool. And yeah, by the time we got home, it was like, whoa, like all right. Like we've now what? Like it almost set the pace for our lives. You know, because it wasn't we had no real interest in going to college because we didn't have you know, my dad didn't go to college and he built his own business, the towing business and the garage business with his two hands. And yeah. So I, my parents didn't force me into college, but they said, if there's something you want to do, we'll support you in, in that. But don't feel like you have to go to college. And so- That's cool that they didn't put that on you. I didn't feel forced to. And after that experience, yeah. the next, 2004, my first full year out of school, I worked construction, building houses, but I pursued the BMX thing. And then by 2005, I got my first pro sponsorship and it was like, wow, this is a, a career path I never even thought would exist. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool that you did that too. I didn't. I didn't realize that same year basically. I think once you get, 
I don't know. Once you get those miles under your belt, it's hard to, it's hard to not like want to just chase that forever. I think it's easier to make, um, it's, it's easier to, and, and we can get into this conversation too, but like with your, with your barbershop, but like, it, I think it makes it easier. you you have more confidence in yourself to make a leap because like a, a leap that may not yeah, seem well, like it's going to pay off. You, you know, if you don't have a five year plan or any goals, so to speak, uh, for some people that's scary. Um, not having that right for me, having that actually seems scary because yeah, I didn't, yeah, I don't, you know, I was like, going to say, I don't have that. I don't want, I, I didn't want a predetermined <laughs> life. I kind of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I've had that impression that my hands are always on the steering wheel. Um, right, right. So, but there's all sorts of different roads ahead of you. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And then that was kind of the exciting part of not knowing where it's going to take you. And I think, you know, probably same thing. Like I grew up skateboarding, grew up through like hardcore and punk and stuff like that. Like, so I think these kind of like subculture worlds or these different things, they, they teach you to think for yourself. They teach you, um, drive and passion and hard work and yep. um, freedom and ability to um, do what you want as you want you mean as you please and uh, you and I were talking about that earlier there's something to be said for essentially creating the life that you want to live and I don't know I mean for some people that might seem selfish but I mean if if you're staying true to yourself and you're doing things that you enjoy and you're not really hurting anybody along the way like it's your life. Oh, it's absolutely. nobody else's life. Like, yep. I mean, I hate to break that to anybody, but it's like, hey, you know what? Like, I've told a million people in my chair, go, hey, why don't you tell your uh, your folks to take it easy? Like, <laughs> yeah. They go, you want to tell them for yeah. me? I go, yeah. I mean, that's not my job. But yeah, exactly. I go, I had to do that on my own, you know? Like, yep. But the thing is, is that it's your life. And uh, obviously, until Elon Musk like can download our consciousness... <laughs> We're, we're on limited yeah. time here. Yeah, so exactly. it's like, and the, the quality of your life and how you live and how you treat yourself and how you, um, you, you know, and, and, and the people you surround yourself with, these are all, you're constantly like a sponge absorbing things. But I think coming up with a mindset, like you said, with folks who didn't try to push you or steer you in a certain way, coming up into something definitely for the time, like through BMX and other, like alternative sports, it was definitely like, uh, you know, cutting edge or, or it, it thought outside the lines. So the way people look, the way that people act, the way they carry themselves, the, the, how they're making money or how they're living or stuff like that, like these are all different things, but they're options. And I think that as great as it is, like you said, I mean, there's many times where I thought I could have definitely taken advantage of, of uh, like earlier education and stuff like that. Right. Um, they weren't an interest to me. So people trying to tell me what to do or how to think oftentimes, not only do I not agree with it, but it, 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 you want to do the opposite. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think it was meant to be rebellious in the sense of like an attention thing. It's just like everybody has to choose their own path or I guess some people's paths get chosen for them, but that just wasn't my interest, nor would I try to choose somebody else's path for their life. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't I mean, think that's fair. My dad, my dad, um, you know, very old school, um, you know, no, didn't tolerate any, any, um, like back talk or rebellious nature towards my mother or mm -hmm. even him, you know, like, like definitely, you know, if I, if I talked back to my mom or, or like disrespected her, like my dad's belt was coming off, you sure. know, and that was, but that, that like, and I can speak from the, that experience, like that, like that put my mom and my dad as the elder in the house and my parents, first of all, to like, they taught me respect and to, to not be as selfish. It's like, all right, like this isn't, <laughs> this is, but anyway, when, as I was getting older and my life course was kind of ahead of me, that's where they were kind of like, I could see them more supportive of like possibly a decision that I wanted to make. And my dad didn't like, he wasn't fully supportive of the BMX thing just because he didn't see me making like a good living financially out of it. Sure. And saw, more realistically saw me irreparably damaging my body through some sort of like crazy injury. Yeah. And I sustained plenty of them. And, I, and when I was still living at home, you know, it, in California in 2005, I busted all my teeth out on the first day of a 12 day trip, flew home Christmas Eve with a busted up mouth. My dentist was on vacation until like July, uh, January 3rd or, you know, another week after yeah. Christmas. And so here I am existing in the house with my parents with like a busted up mouth with my teeth missing. And, and 
I can tell that my dad's like, you got you got to get a real job. <laughs> but my first two page spread in a magazine, like although he was he's the kind he's the kind of dad where it wasn't like right to my face like wow this is incredible it was it was i heard it from sure the guys in town I'm like you know your dad had that magazine he was showing us that photo of you in that magazine i'm like my dad really and they're like yeah yeah oh yeah he's super excited about it and i'm like oh i'm like so i got it like he had that he had that like father figure image like and he was trying to corral me to where i wasn't you know gonna end up living my life in a wheelchair or right. something right i mean i don't think that, that you know if the, if if they if they care they don't want to set you up for uh failure exactly because they know and that's it that now that we're adults i look back and i wasn't a rebellious kid but like i, I was hard-headed and i look back as a 35 year old now and i'm like i get why my parents said and did these things because <laughs> like, oh, if i had an 18 year old who was acting like me as a parent i'd be losing my mind <laughs> there's still life lessons that just almost knock me off my feet once in a while. I'm sure. <laughs> you just go, oh, oh, that's why. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and it's funny because that's why my my parents and I are like friends now. And, and anyone that listens to this podcast through through my through my reach knows that I've got a real solid relationship with my dad. You know, we built cars together. We, you know, he's a, he's a friend of mine. And, and you know, it, it would shock some people the fact that like he would spank me with his belt as a child, but now we're like, like best of friends it's like it, it was a i that, that that dynamic came to fruition the way every parent and every child would wish it would you know what i mean like where that we're friends now and i look back on yeah some of the moves i made and i'm like man my dad is a like a saint for holding it together through some of the things that like i wanted to do or some of the nonsense i i wanted to pursue and I mean, it's got to be terrifying. It's got to be being responsible to make sure that this living, breathing creature that's your DNA <laughs> is got to be like forming its, its own thoughts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, but to also be, but to also, but to also like nurture without like, like you were saying, without like forcing your for hand. Sure. And and my parents, I feel like, did that in the best way. And I, when I think about possibly having kids in the future, it. I it's I don't even have like the girl I don't even have the girl that I know I'm gonna get married to a part of that equation sure. yet. and I already find myself stressing out about being a good parent and what kind of what kind of like you know because I, I don't want to if I could I'd emulate ex everything my parents did because I'm like all right because my sister is a D1 division volleyball coach and is like career orientated and she married she, she didn't date until she was in like her early or mid twenties and she married that man and she's not polluted by all these like men who took advantage of her. She made like, she, she was career focused all the way through school. She wasn't dating around. She wasn't like at parties and like sleeping around. Mm -hmm. And like the first dude for the most part was that she went into her life in that way. She married and it was the right guy. She like, and I'm like, I was never promiscuous, but I was like, I dated through my twenties and I was, a, I was a nightmare. I, was, I had no idea what I wanted, what I was searching for. And so when I look at where my sister and I both are now in our thirties, I'm like, man, like as an, as a parent, what moves do you make to make sure your kids end up happy and end up like with a good set of values, but good work ethic. And they're like, and they're just, they're just set up for what the world might throw at them, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think up to a certain point, they can only provide you with so much, right? Yeah. Like, you got to take the reins at some point. I yeah. think I was, I think I was probably, I don't know, early teens. And I think I was going down to Boston with some friends to go see some bands play. And my folks had split up when I was young. And um, so there's many things that my mom, living with my mom was like, cool, like off the radar with my pops, like wouldn't, you know, wouldn't right, say. Right, right. But she also said to me one time as I was getting older and probably, you know, starting to branch out and have my own ideas. She said something along the lines of, you know, we, we've given you all we can give. You've got a conscience. You know the difference between right and wrong. But she said, uh, just because you don't rob the bank, if you're in the getaway car, you're just as guilty. And I, I remember she said that to me. And I'm not sure. <laughs> what was going on? Uh, well, I'm not sure what made her... <laughs> <laughs> want to tell me that or what I was up to that led yeah, her, but, yeah. but it, it, it struck me like lightning and I, I knew exactly what she meant and she knew that I knew exactly what she meant. Yep. And, uh, at an early age, I had that comprehension. So it comes to the point where you can only like, uh, water these plants for so long 
till they need to find their own water. Right. But then at the same time, um, y- you know, you're going to make decisions on your own, which um, may poorly reflect, you know, like, cause I'm sure as like a parent, like now that you run your children like a business, but you want to be successful, right? You want to nurture them. You want to love them. You want to take care of them. You want to be healthy, safe, strong, all those things. But there comes a point in time where like you can't shelter people. Like they need to Ex- grow and exactly. be themselves yep. and identify how they de- with themselves, you know? Yep. And, but there's got to be that tipping point where your parents must go like, oh, man, I hope this works out. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be a crazy feeling for a parent when, you know, it's like you almost have to learn that like letting go. Sure. Um, not, not in a disowning way, but like where it's like they're their own person now. And it's, and it's like, you can still offer guidance and advice and Definitely. direction, but it's like, there you that, go. <laughs> and that was always, that was made clear to me at a very young age that, Hey, uh, we'll always love you, but that doesn't mean we'll always support you in the sense where like, right. If you screw up and you make a bad decision, that's on you yep. and you need to learn it to like, to live with it and how to amend that and, and whatever the case may be. But just know that you'll always be loved, but that it comes a point in time where you need to like be responsible for your own actions. Yeah. Um, and so that probably, you know, part of that mentality between, like you said, growing up with the stuff you're into, want, when you grow, like you want to go out on your own, you want to live on your own, you want to create your own world. Part of that, now thinking about it, is probably is, is, is a big like fundamental of, of going out and you go like, hey, I know I've got the tools for the job. Now, look, let's just go find out and make the most of it. And yep. I mean, life's a constant adventure. You know, it's uh, like you were saying earlier, you don't know if you want to be here in the winter or you know you don't want to be in the winter, but you don't know where <laughs> yeah, you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, series, it's a series of challenges. And I think that, um, I think that life is difficult. I think it's um, not always wonderful. I think it's hard. But occasionally you can find these things that fill you with... Um, with pleasure and enjoyment and fulfillment that make it more tolerable. Um, yeah. And like you said earlier, we were talking about like, you know, being able to communicate with the world and be able to put information online and take cool pictures and show things. It, it's nice. Um, and I guess if the worst thing that ever happened is if people portray themselves in a, or in a, in a happy light or a, doing cool things stuff, it's not the worst thing that ever happened, but um, that isn't reality. Cause I mean, who right. wants to go online and like watch them like, you know, some sappy stuff about, uh, you know, how today was terrible, this on the other, but that, that, that is reality. Right. And yeah, in yeah. a weird way that like we, y- you know, and maybe it's just the way we were fostered also growing up, but like there's, and I'm not saying it's right, but like you, you build up the resiliency where you like, you, you brave through it. And if you fail, you get up and you try again. Um, but not everybody has that programming. Not everybody has that same mindset. Right. Yeah. And so I, it bums me out when I see generations of people or online, like, you know, you have people that have this very strong, like, um, machismo BS. That's like, you know, calling people snowflakes or this or that or the other. It's like, Hey, just because people are doing different than you doesn't make it wrong. But, um, people are navigating differently through the world today. And I think one of the good things that come out of, especially such a terrible year, like we're living in, is that people are learning how to use their voice. People are learning how to speak up. They're talking about their feelings. And in return, people have found other groups of people like themselves Yep. where they don't feel uh, marginalized or minimalized or that they're wrong for thinking or feeling a certain way. And I think that's powerful because strength in numbers is always a big thing, right? I mean, that's kind of like how you found your friends, how you found like what you're into is like, especially if you were kind of like a weird person living in a desolate area that was into different stuff that a lot of people couldn't understand or didn't make any sense to they just had the wrong lens they couldn't see the focus but you eventually find those other people or hopefully you find some people that like are kind of on that same journey with you to to go through life so yeah. um you know whether it be through business through financial through love through whatever the case is aligning yourself and finding stuff other people and not even just like in a purposefully meticulous way but i think at some point in time like you can you know you pretend to be like a magnet you you attract the strays and if you've always felt like you kind of don't fit in there are other people out there like you that whatever it is you're into that you know hopefully you find but 
planning your whole life out, it just sounds tedious and boring. And yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, the, the idea of the idea of you go to college, you get a job, you retire, you go on a couple holidays, you die. Like that is like the craziest, you know, like that, that almost makes me feel uncomfortable sure. thinking just even though that won't be me, but like thinking about it, it's like, wow. And, 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 and like you said, as you, as you grow up and you become like your own person as an adult and you start to discover more of these people that are more along your wavelength, sure. you realize, especially years like, I mean, everybody's feeling it this year, but if you specifically are having a tough year through something and you've got this really strong network of like friends and people that kind of understand like where you want to be or whatever, the people you surround yourself with, if they're constructive people, it's like that now you've got like all the power, you know, and all to, to, to push through, a, a tough year like this year and stuff and 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 like we we're saying before make leaps of faith you know if you're if you're at some dead-end job and you're just miserable every day you wake up miserable if it's not a saturday yeah. or sunday it's like you're just miserable and and you're like you get this idea and you're like man there's too much risk though to like leave my job and start this thing you're like there's too much risk then you start getting people i go to my friends all the time even people i don't know i'll put out a feeler on like social media and be like like all right thinking of doing this what do y'all think? And just and just read everything. Read the pros, cons. Like, because there's some people that might just have like some outlandish idea about something, but then some people being like, I did that same thing yeah. and it paid off. And and but with the people closest to me, yeah, I'll bounce ideas off. And this one person who might be in some miserable job who is just under this like mental health like weight. And they might have a few friends that are just like, dude, just do it. Like, just just do it. You can always get another job. Like, just yeah, go and definitely. And you're right. And I think this year is a, is a turning point for many people, almost like a ground zero. And um, I feel like I'm one of them, even though I'm still doing what I was doing last year, with the exception of like this podcast and stuff. I feel like I'm one of them too, where it's it's made me kind of recalculate where I'm at, what I'm doing, uh, what is sustainable. Because there's a lot of things that mm -hmm. because of this year that we realize aren't sustainable. And it's crazy. Well, I think if anything, it's taught us what we have and what we need are two dynamically different things. Yeah. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, um, really what do you need to survive? And I don't even just mean like monetary things or things you own, but like people want a sense of security. Mm -hmm. Um, people want to have a place where they have a roof over the head. They have food in their bellies, the simple things. And, um, unfortunately there's people, uh, in our own country and state and even throughout the world, that are definitely far from even having like the most basic things. Right. Right. Um, so I think for a lot of people that this year went in real strong, you know, was the metaphors 2020, like Dude, clear vision, right? Same. Like boom, same. January 1st, social yep. media, like, let's do this. Let's go. We got this. Yep. You know, and then, uh, it hits the fan two months in. <laughs> yeah. And then people go like, wow, I need yep. to really, I need to really like think about things. Um, so I, I, I think, there's going to be people who are just like you said, they're just going to jump at opportunity. And there's going to be people who they didn't have the choice to be like, well, should I do this or should I not do this? So should I put a survey out? It's like, Hey, uh, you don't have a job anymore. Uh, rent or mortgages do you're going to lose everything you have. And now you have like 28 days to figure out how to do this. And so yep. for a lot of people, I think they have, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's many people that it hasn't worked out for too, but, I've definitely had some valuable conversations with people who at the beginning of the year are living, you know, large, like largely different lives than how they started the beginning of this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure there's a silver lining in everything, but this has been, this is a year, this is a year I think people are going to look back and they're going to read in the history books. Like this is going to be in many oh, different absolutely. ways. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think for a very long time we'll forget this, but it's, if anything, to be able to come out, this year with a little bit of, like I said, like happiness and security is, is, um, it, it's going to be a success in that, yep. in that regards because it's tough. Um, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been real hard navigating. Uh, I mean, I, as you do too, you get friends from all over sure. different walks of life, different, uh, workforces, you know, people who have been furloughed or laid off all this time and may have been not necessarily living beyond their means, but, on that paycheck to paycheck thing. And now all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, like now what? Or yeah. people who 
have been in a, a business where they could just work from home and the gears keep turning mm -hmm. and it's like, all right, well, I can't travel as much as I want to this year. Uh, I got to stay around my town more than usual, but yeah, know, we'll count down the days. So there's, yeah, like you said, then there's people who are living, who will never live their life the same again yeah. after this, which is just yeah. so crazy. Yeah. And I think a lot of industries have really, um, have come out like are like flourishing pretty well in this stuff. Like you said, even locally, like, um, you know, for instance, like where we live, obviously we have limited time where restaurants that have outdoor seating that right, yeah. within, within a couple season. months, that's going to be, um, that's going to be a difficult thing. They did in New Hampshire. They just, a couple of days ago, I think it was Friday, Friday evening, the governor just declared, um, immediately 100% occupancy, all restaurants across state. Um, 100% occupancy. 100%. Yep. In every County. Well, I didn't hear that. Yeah. So I think that was Friday right around dinner time. And so, um, that's good in some regards for the places that didn't have the ability to serve outside, but obviously that's, you know, presents a different set of challenges and conversations. But yeah, yeah. I think that there are a lot of people who go like, Hey, you know what? Like I know that person or I drive by that place or I love getting food from there. I'm going to, even if I don't have a lot of extra money, I'm going to spend a little bit extra because I want them to be open yep. whenever when this, we get to this. Yeah. Yep. And so I think a lot of people are putting value and their time and their money and what limited refunds and sources they have into people, into places, into businesses, into things that they care about that matter. And people are really showing that support in many ways. Um, and I think that that's great. And I think um, that that's what's going to keep things moving that people aligning themselves with those kind of things. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and on that, on that subject, uh, let's talk about Lucky's, let's, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. that's obviously your barbershop. Um, yeah. So, but, so, well, I mean, so you've, I've, I mean, I've been tagging you since I started social media. I mean, you've been cutting my hair for, Oh my gosh, 10 years now. Yeah. 11 almost. Yep. I mean, you as in the shop. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, um, but you've, well, let's let's go before the shop. So sure. we lived pretty comparable. Like we kind of hit the same communities aside from like, yeah. I know you kind of grew up riding, like skating and stuff too. But I mean, I got into BMX real hard. But We're not both, far apart though. But we both played music. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still do. You still do. Um, was music a pretty big the biggest thing before uh, you wanted to be a barber? Definitely. You've been a barber since what, 2000? Yeah. Yeah. I got my license in 2000. Um, but for the couple of years, I grew up going to barbershop and then I, I, I started cutting hair when I was 12, it was 1992. Um, oh, crazy. I guess I didn't know you were cutting the, hair that, that young. And that's a long story. I won't bore you with, but I grew up going to a barbershop <laughs> and essentially the one day that I was visiting my old man, we went real early and the shop was too busy. He had no patience. So later that day in his little hot third story apartment, he essentially made me give him a haircut with these Clippers he used to shave like his German Shepherds down with in the eighties when I was a kid. So, um, so that, that, that was the beginning. <laughs> that that was the beginning that, that was forced upon me. Uh, little did I know that, you know, within a decade that that's something that I would pursue, but I, I had no dreams of being a barber or anything like that. Um, but I was speaking of hot apartment. I'm going to open this door real quick. I, so yeah. So, um, barbering, I guess was always, or at least from the age of 12 was always there but it wasn't something that I even considered a hobby. It was just something I did. I thought it was cool, but, no. um, oh yeah, like for sure. So growing up, like my mom was like this, like little hippie rock and roller from like way up in Vermont. And my father was, and they're both, they both grew up in like farms in different small towns, like, and he grew up up North in New Hampshire. And, um, by the time they met, he had already done a tour, um, with the army enlisted during the Vietnam era. Um, when Did he go overseas? He was years? overseas. He spent most of his time in Europe and Eastern Europe um, and some other places I'm not sure of, but I mean, that's good for him. I mean, not. Yeah. 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 He was, I, I think he was, he floated around quite a bit. In fact, his first, uh, before my mother, he was actually married to uh, a woman from Germany. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Didn't speak any English <laughs> or anything. Yeah. I say so, that's awesome. because so, I, 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 I mean, I never met her, you know, yeah. but he, he had, he had, he was, you know, he had a, a life over there and, and whatnot. And that didn't work out, but met my mother. And I mean, they couldn't be further from, they had the, the two most <laughs> different dynamically people. different people, <laughs> like oil and water. Yeah. But it, yeah. I guess it worked for 20 years. I think, you know, they, we're probably together for a decade or more 
before they had me and they didn't last quite a decade, I guess, once they had me, but, yeah. um, but she was this like, you, you know, uh, real rock and roll, like dude, hair down, like past her butt, like just this like yeah. hippie out in the woods, party, hanging out. My old man was just like wild animal, like, <laughs> but rigid at the same time, just like, but just complete, like wild just in and growing up you know of course you don't know the stories like uh about, about your folks typically because that's back to Lou said wanting to set an example for you exactly um a different kind of wild but so they but for him he was really into old um old country and old rockabilly and rock and roll and so music was always played in the car in the house um neither really played instruments um and my mom was big into like, you know, she had records around and she had this cool, like, um, uh, what, like the headphone cord with the, what do you call it? Like they make them for guitars now, like the, you know, they're like spiral, just, like just, the, just the coiled cord. Yeah. yeah like yeah, cool yeah. old, like huge monster right. headphones. So I would sit down and she'd let me put on records. And in fact, when I was a kid, I don't know where they got it, but they had like, it was like Kazam kazoo with some dude. And she played on one of my birthdays somewhere five, six, seven, eight years old. It was a little 45, a seven inch record. And it said like my name and it was like, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> and I'd play that record over and over and over to the point where like, dude, she would plug in the headphones, put them on my head. She's so like, all right, she, if you're going to listen yeah. to this, you're going to sit there. Like we can't take any more of this. But yeah. so music was always played and I thought it was real cool. And like, um, I loved all that stuff that you grew up on from your folks, like Van Morrison and the band. And I think my mom was in, really into the dead and like, uh, Leonard Skinner and you know st stuff yeah. like that and my old man um you know you had like Johnny Cash and Hank and Conway yep. Twitty and all that old good stuff and yep. the big bopper was a big one and Roy Orbison and so it was a good fundamental and then it got to the point where they had like this Columbia trading house thing where what it like do what a scam it's like the first <laughs> cassette tape is like 99 cents and then they got you like a mortgage for like years. But it's like $22, yeah. like a cassette tape through the 80s and 90s. Oh so like my gosh. you've got to buy them at that point. And, you know, um, but I remember like Beach Boys was um, one of the first tapes I bought. Also, Fat Boys was one of the first tapes I bought. Oh which I don't goodness. know if you remember the Fat Boys, but they were three guys, you know, of larger size. And they were a rap group. But they had this dude that like they were funny. And they actually got like a movie deal out of it. I think it was called the Disorderlies. Yeah. Starring the Fat Boys. And like they worked at like, I don't know, it'd be the equivalent of like uh like an older folks home. And like, but they <laughs> it was crazy. It was so those so it went from like the stuff they listened to to like so then I, I it was like, okay, Beach Boys, like I know that one. I ordered that tape. And then I got Fat Boys. I think it was like crushing or something like that. And then it starts delving into it. And then like early nineties, like I got really into, and I don't remember where I was exposed to at first, but like hip hop stuff. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And like, um, grand Puba tribe called quest, yep. De La soul, the yep. far side. But I was really taken because a lot of those bands were using like old jazz standards and they were cutting looping, like upright bass and real cool. Yeah. Like tribe called quest was doing that a big lot. time. Yeah. yeah. And so like that stuff, I really, really liked it. And, um, and that evolved into other, other groups and stuff like that. And, and then that started to evolve into like kind of like harder stuff, like um, you know, you had like Onyx, Cypress Hill. Yep. Um, yep. I don't know if Gangster Eric B. And Rakim. Uh, I just, was about to say when we're talking about stand up bass, Eric B. And Rakim yeah, is dude, like so, that stuff is so good. Public Enemy, so yeah. good. And and it's funny, uh, you know, as an adult, like I still love all that stuff, and but at the time I didn't hear, wasn't ready to understand like the messages they were talking about. Right. Right. Um, and. So, but I, I, I think I liked the fact that like it was, the music was captivating, but some of like, some of the lyrics, sometimes they sounded angry, sometimes they just were. And I think then out of that, getting exposed through skateboarding, also like through like punk rock and somebody giving like a duped cassette tape. And it really, the two music isn't like, the genres of music might sound different, but they're not different. They both come from a place of like pain and anger. They both come yep. from a place of like creativity and artistic freedom. And they're both like uh, very, well, I mean, nowadays the, the styles have really like, you know, over the years meshed, um, meshed like pretty yeah. big time, but they both come from a place of like, um, 
uh, of I think of pain and anger and and solitude and also finding like and, and and talking about the things that they don't have things they need and things you want and wanting change and and so um, music's always been there and on the music side of things I was um, spending a little bit of time up in Vermont where my mom grew up in my cousin's house because as a kid I got to go up there and spend time and I was looked forward to it and then when I hit um, my early teenage years. My mom was like, oh, we're going to Vermont. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to hang down here. And she's like, no, no, you don't have a choice. Like, <laughs> so she's like to get me like out of trouble, keep me like she, she, you know, would bring me up the middle of nowhere. But I met this kid, Frank, and um, he was into skateboarding. He was into music and hip hop and punk rock. And he had like a little bass in his like bedroom in his house. And so we just kicked it and it was great. And then when I came back to New Hampshire um, that summer from being up there, my mom, my mom's boyfriend, um, he played in a band. And so I had told them on the phone when they called to check on me, like, what have you been doing? I'm like skateboarding and playing this bass. And they're like, playing a bass. I was like, yeah, yeah, this, this dude, Frank's got a bass. He let me borrow it. And it had like nylon strings, which I've, to this day, I've never really seen. I've yeah. seen them on uprights, but I'd never seen it to this day, like on a electric yeah. bass. And they were cool because they were also kind of quiet, but had nylon strings. So, they surprised me because I think they were like, they thought it was cool that I was into music. Um, when I got back, the um, my mom's boyfriend, the guy who played bass in his band, who was also in old custom vans, dude, he had Clockwork Orange mural on the, on oh the, on the back of his, gosh. like he had this crazy gullwing van. It was wild. Yeah, so cool music, cool vans, cool stuff. Yep. But they were like, the dude Barry had an old 60s Sears silver tone bass that you'd order like the Sears Craftsman, like yep. out of the catalog. And when I got back, they had a Rickenbacker like amp, which I think was a guitar amp, like a 212. And then they gave me this Rickenbacker um, on loan to use. And I would just sit and just play it. And uh, I just make a That's noise awesome. and just yep. grind. I think the amp blew in like the first month. It was just <laughs> wicked as awesome to make noise. Yep. And within yep. a year, um, I had two or three friends that had already started playing music and playing in bands. They got more into like kind of jam stuff, but they were really good. Uh, my, 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 my best friend growing up, Maddie, um, dude, we loved Pearl Jam. We still love Pearl Jam, but like, yep. I think 10 came out of like 92 or 93 and that dude, Maddie's left-handed and it somehow got his hands on like a bass and it was a right-handed fretless bass. So how would you even learn how to like, even if you could read music or follow a book? Right. So this cat would flip the bass over. So no fretting. So didn't know where any of the scales were. Things upside down with the strings in different order. And that dude by ear listening to like Pearl Jam over and over and over by Jeff Ahman playing like all those bass. So good. That's so like, awesome. And those dudes would be better than I could have ever imagined. But within a year, this other cat, Berkey, I knew, he bought a bass off our other buddy, Jay, who had a bass, was really into Primus and all that flea and all that oh, kind of yeah. slap stuff. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> dude had like a little practice amp for 80 bucks. Um, with the hard case, it was like a three quarter scale. I still have it actually. Um, he was getting rid of the bass. I found out about it. And I think it was, I was like 15. And I think for my birthday, my mom, my mom wrote, <laughs> wrote Berkey a check for like the 80 bucks. Maybe it was, maybe it was 85. <laughs> and it was it said like, you know, to Brian, like, and for, for the bass for like my birthday. And I thought that was so rad that That's they were awesome. like, they were into it. So uh, me and a couple other kids at school, dude, we just, we loved music. We loved skating and we were just listening to like ton of punk stuff and getting to like, I got like more like into like a lot of hardcore stuff. And one of the dudes just wanted to just play music, get a drum kit. So we would sit in the basement and we had a couch and we'd like try to like kick flip and do like varials and pop shove it's off the couch onto the like basement <laughs> yeah. floor. And then we'd play music and stuff. And that was where our first band started. And probably all three of us were playing something different at the same time, but that's, that's where that started, but it was an extension of like, just kind of being yourself, finding yourself. And then as I got older, I learned that, um, and music, uh, so I answered your question long winded, but music filled in all the blanks that my parents couldn't provide for me. Like, uh, morally, musically, fashion wise, like, yep. Yep. you know, the way you look, the way you carry yourself, the way you thought, the way you acted, the way, like very, very heavily influenced by the music. Um, same from an early too. age yeah yeah and as i got older i learned that like all the circles i kept in the places i traveled that it was a vehicle for so many things even though i didn't look at it or see it for many years Yeah, it was just happening to you yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and still to this day i mean uh you know i could pinpoint every single place i've been and most likely 
that had something to do with music and or barbering and oftentimes collectively both um yeah they're they're, they're, they've those two things in my life have become intertwined because a lot of people that i'm surrounded by um are also very heavily impacted by that stuff like music shaped their early formative years into their adulthood and that's i think when you kind of come from like a place like that like and i don't know like i'm sure like lady gaga's sick right but like and i know she's like she's got a voice and a lot of like empowers a lot of people but in a different way like i don't know how many people like in that kids that grow up in subcultures if they're as impacted by like what you hear on the radio like i don't know if it has like a life changing yeah, thing to the yeah, point where like know. you're like this is who i hang with this is how i roll this is what i think and this all came from music and i don't know how many people have taken it that seriously or that it's yeah. changed their life like that you'll forever be impacted by that yeah because i i certainly it certainly did that to me i'm i'm really the only musician in my family too my 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 mother and my father can both sing like they music was always on in the car and in the house and it was usually my dad loves 60s he's not much in the 70s you know not really he'll listen to like zeppelin and stuff on like the radio but stuff that he liked was like american graffiti yeah, yeah. like soundtrack and stuff like 60s uh and, and like just whatever's on the radio for like country so yeah. usually we, we usually only other either heard country on the radio or like 60s you know era yeah americana music um but when I started playing guitar in seventh grade, it was because two of my classmates got guitars and I was just like, you can, you can make music like with your hands. Like this is awesome. And so through that, once I started getting into like my own style of music in high school, it was the first one without making this a long winded end of my story. Cause I talk about it a lot. Uh, the first like exposure I had to like heavy music was rage against the machine. You know? And I was like, and to this day it holds up, you know, but I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. And so I started a band with Pat, my buddy who I yep. went west with, and uh, a couple other my classmates. Uh, we call it, it was a band called Sovereign. And it was like, it's a hard name. And it was like, it was like, <laughs> it's a hard name. It was, <laughs> it was basically, Reunion. it was basically like Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> like, Dude, I mean, I it, learned every song. Like Tom Morello was like my favorite guitar player ever because I liked, it was all, I was ignorant. I didn't know everything about Che Guevara and like all the political angles that Zach De La Roca was like singing yeah. about, but it, it all sounded cool. Cause you could tell it was like rebellious was and it was like, and you could hear it in his voice. And it was like, and we didn't like being at school. So we're like, yeah, like this oh, is, yeah. and so I learned every song on the self-titled album and evil empire. I remember when Battle of Los Angeles came out. I almost thought that was like too new. I'm like, nah, this isn't Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> but our first high school band, which I've got all those cassette tapes Love I was it. telling you about before. Because my dad used to do all the sound at my church when I was a kid. So Love we it. had gear at the house. And so I set up a little band space in the basement at the house and had like an eight track, uh, not an eight track, but a um, like a four track mixer with a cassette tape. And I've still got all that stuff, so which is cool. crazy. And I could hear it. It was all like octave based, like all that like yeah. Rage Against the Machine sound. And Pat was just like yelling to it. And it was all just nonsense. You know, it was all it's just great. like truth will prevail and like all this weird stuff. But that's what exposed me to that. And then it got into, I don't remember how I heard it. Ooh, it was a skate video. And I can't remember which one. It was a skate video I saw. And it exposed me to at the drive in. And I was like, done this is the style of music I, I like it was at the drive-in and a band called refused which was a post-hardcore band from sweden and they got big over here and was it the shape of punk the shape of punk to come was yeah. their last album yeah. that was 98 and it was a song that was off that album that i first heard and i was like this is it between dennis lixon of refused and uh cedric from at the drive-in I'm like this is i've found and so, yeah, anyway, it, it shaped me as well with like my fashion, uh, right around that time when I graduated high school is when I started like dressing a little bit different yeah. and, um, wore, wore vans more, uh, and, and rather than like big skate shoes and, and yeah, it's kind of crazy how that formed. Um, but it's like, it's, it's funny how like, and there's people will come and go. Um, but how sometimes when that light switch goes on, you, you just, you can't turn it off. It stays on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because I know you still play music. I, I mean, we're sitting in my studio now. I mean, I still play music. But before I forget, when you're talking about bass, I, I played bass for a long time too. And my grandfather actually had bought me my first bass because I was playing bass. 
the church I was in when I was a kid was kind of contemporary. It was like like youth driven as far as the music went. So as learning guitar, I was like, I want to play if I'm going to be at church with my family anyway. Like I want to play the I want to play the music. Yeah. So they needed a bass player. So I picked it up and I learned I learned arpeggios and I learned scales and I was and I was self taught, but I like immersed myself in the theory of music and immediately immediately to this day pork soda and frizzle fry two of my favorite albums primus oh, like, oh. Les claypool is like one of my favorite favorite artists and i don't hardly ever talk about it i don't even think anybody that knows me in the, the last 10 years out. knows the truth but, is out. oh my gosh frizzle fry primus is i don't know if that's like his third album is like genius yeah his voice is weird and he sings like this and it's all but, weird but that the the music like that dude i mean if you hear that now you go like yo that's kind of weird yeah. but that's what i mean but like it's it's doing something different i mean the fact that i mean you know primus is a huge you watch them they they did the uh woodstock 94 yeah they were huge like people the, were losing it. it was it's so crazy like how old that stuff actually is and when cliff burton died the basis of metallica yeah, yeah. les claypool actually auditioned to be the bass player of Metallica. I heard this recently, <laughs> right? Oh, recently? So I knew this like a long time ago because I was all about this. And James Hatfield, yeah, I watched an interview with James Hatfield and he was like, yeah, that dude is way too good for us. Yeah, <laughs> which is wild, right? It's so, And it's probably because he's like an odd dude, like Les Claypool. At this point, Primus was big, so they were like, hey, that dude's way too crazy for us. But yeah, it came down to that he was just too good of a bass player. They're like, yeah, sure. we, need, we need somebody who could just like, just like lay that, but it, down he just, took something that was people had looked at an instrument like that for a very long time decades. Not that people, yeah not yeah. that people weren't playing funk and doing different stuff like that and and soul but that guy just mashed the heavy stuff yeah with funk and with soul yeah i think and that like, i think this i think the sans amp pedal became way more prevalent in like the overdrive playing, yeah, yeah then after primus because he had that grungy distorted and it was the it was the uh driving instrument of the band that, right and you not often oftentimes you wouldn't see that as as the primary front right front of the, right. of the band so for that guy to look at an instrument which people had done for decades and to go like no i'm gonna play it differently i'm gonna do something like <laughs> yeah you know totally different and i'm sure it wasn't by design i'm sure it's just the way his brain worked but yeah yeah dude, just so crazy that's what i mean like there's 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 people that are just they're they're captivating and people like they people they grasp on those things. They see those things. Yeah, and you know he would have been playing that type of music whether or not people were into it or not. Well, it's that's the, the thing, he's right? A true artist, you know. And 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 that's the thing with today. Like, what are people doing for themselves, and what are they doing for other people? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, kind of we're saying earlier, like you got to make yourself happy. Yep. Um, but having an outlet for creativity through art or music or writing or or like whether or not people are listening hopefully you're doing it for the right reasons for yourself, but sometimes cool stuff comes out of that. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you find other people that, that have similar interests or common bonds and goals that you make through those things. And sometimes it, it opens up cool, cool friendships and traveling yep. and opportunities and different stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. And an opportunity to do something different. Well, you know, like you said, maybe you played music and then maybe you get into like painting or something like in the art sure. or something through music. Yeah. You know? Or yeah. like you said, riding a BMX, did you think would ever, you'd ever take off across the country just to, yeah. you know, like that's the same thing. Like, so there's many avenues of transportation, you know, not, not even just in a vehicular way that, that allow you creative outlets to, you know, to pursue, to pursue a different life than, than most people will never know or understand, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I feel for those people. I mean, I've got friends as I'm sure you do too, that just live that cubicle life and, and it's it's the safe it's the safe route. You know what I mean? Like you get a job, or you, you go to school, you get the job, you work the job, you get your time off, you get your paid holiday after you know mm -hmm. a year, and or whatever. And then you've got your weekends, and you get married, you have kids, you continue to work that job, you get the gold watch at fifty five, sure. sixty or sixty five now or whatever. One toe dangling over the grave, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, and then your health's gone, and but you played it safe, you know. And it's like, if I could. And I'm still in the process of trying to figure it out. But like, if I could shake my friends that do that, that are, that are clearly miserable doing this, it's like, just like make a, take that scary plunge and just. Do you think though that those, those people are yearning for more? Do you think they know the difference? Like, because some people I talk to, they, they don't have like, they don't have a, like a, an itch to scratch. It's just not yeah, there. Yeah, you're right. And, and 
I, I don't know because we're not cut from that cloth. So like I, don't, I don't know. It might seem complacent to us, but to them, for some people, they it, live that, for the weekend. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Very well could be. Um, but I've got plenty of friends that work in office buildings and stuff, and and they do take pride in their work, and they're compensated well, which is great. I mean, the health benefits and all that go a long way today. But, um, but our our doers, you know, like they like from 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. on, they're like, they're working on like their car or they're yeah. working, they're just constant doers. And sometimes I, I almost wish I had that. I probably do, but I almost wish I had that tenacity to like work a full time gig because my roller coaster is high and low. It's constantly yeah. inconsistent. And, uh, uh, but I see some of these other people doing like, everything when they have to be tied down for eight hours a day monday to friday which is crazy for sure but, and, and i think two things can happen too like well one a lot of people don't have jobs that define them right you know like most people don't f feel fulfilled that they, they, they don't feel like they get to be themselves they feel like they don't get to be around people that they chose they feel like they don't get to express themselves create creatively passionately fundamentally um and i feel fortunate because i know i'm in the minority where i i, I am in a world in yeah. a place in a trade um in a little ecosystem that um caters to all those things but i also know that that still doesn't define you know everybody that that does this kind of work but in return then there's people on the flip side who do things that we enjoy as a hobby and sometimes those hobbies because they're so passionate become a job and then people get burnt out on it right. and they don't want to yeah. do it and mm -hmm. then you know um they don't exuberate anymore um joy or love for what was once something that brought them a passion and, yeah that fulfilled all those like you know kind of like you said like the ebb and flow of of life um yeah yeah and so yeah i mean dude seeking balance is um i don't know if, i don't think there's an answer for it it's something i ponder all the time i do too and i and friends of mine who are older than me like mid 40 year old friends who are business owners and from the outside looking in it looks like they're very successful and doing very well and and they'll tell me all the time they're like it never ends like it's a rat race it's don't ever think that you're gonna get to that spot where it's like it's and, and i'm sure you're the same you know opening a second location it's like there's always it's like relative comfort but it's it's like always an ever-changing for sure and I, I think here's something a lot of people take for granted when you see something and it's running smooth or seems to be going pretty well a lot of times people don't understand all the behind the scenes stuff, right. you know, the gears and, that are turning and yeah. And that doesn't mean it's bad stuff. It just, it's work and not everybody is cut out for that kind of thing. Myself, I'm the type of person where I'm always going to have a list with lists of lists on it. But for some people where that would be aggravating and frustrating and overwhelming and not fun or enjoyable, those are things that keep me grounded, keep me in line, keep right. me motivated, keep me striving, keep me pushing forward. And I like that. Um, it doesn't mean that, Everybody doesn't need like a minute just to take a breath once in a while, but having something to make sure that you're responsible for and to take care of, um, I, in my world that I find that to be very important, you know, I don't have children. So maybe that's like, that's that version where, you know, if people have kids, they need to make sure that they're safe and taken care of and, right. and, you know, um, that they need to curate and, and make sure you know that they grow up and responsibly and how they like same thing with the business like you need to const or at least in my you know in my time i've noticed that you need to constantly be on top of it you need to be evolving you need to figure out you know what's working what isn't working how to make this better how to improve and there's always room for improvement no matter how how you know good or smooth things are saying like it could all be gone in a minute. And I, I, I 1000% never take it for granted. And in return, it's probably not like healthy to think that everything could be gone in a minute. But I find that that drive keeps me from being complacent and keeps me on my toes. And, um, you know, I've had people in my life that didn't understand that where it's, it's not worked out because of those reasons, you know, with friendships, relationships, because I've always put that first and right. finding that balance can be difficult, but, so you do need to learn how, how to, you know, how to adequately like place your time and put stuff into that. And that, but sometimes it just takes, takes those years and years it is. of yeah, doing yeah. something yeah. to where it gets to the point, like where you said, where, you know, it gets a little smoother, a little less bumps in the road. Or like you said, even with, instead of, you said, you know, it could be working 
a job doing all these hours a week instead of that roller coaster. But at some point in time too, or hopefully the longer you do it, it's less of a roller coaster and, and, and more of like a cruise, you know, like autopilot. And I don't mean autopilot like, yeah, hey, yeah. like I'm just going through life. But um, just like anything, it, it, it takes time to fill in those gaps. Well, and if I, and if, and if, if I look at those highs, the highs and lows of basically work is busy, work is slow, work is busy, work is slow. But my mind, my mindset used to follow that. Yeah. When it was slow, I'd freak out like, all right, I got to generate business or I, this isn't working. I got to go get a job yeah. type deal. But then even though that consistent of like feast or famine or whatever you want to call it, busy, slow, all that stuff, I've been able to like put my mind on that autopilot type of mindset where when work gets slow, but, but not slow because I'm like slacking off. Just, it's just kind of some jobs came in, it was real busy and now it's slowing down. I've learned how to not freak out and work on this podcast more, work on the YouTube more. And although those things aren't paying any money yet, hopefully, but like aren't, they're not, I'm not receiving any like, like ROI on this yet, but I've, I've trained myself to not freak out, take a deep breath. I was like, all right, I don't have any work for the next couple of days. I'm going to work on, I'm going to work on like recording this episode, get this done, work on the next YouTube episode of like working on the century, get that done. Maybe spend a couple of nights working on some music, Sure. you know, and, and then, and as we, as we speak this morning, I got two emails about a couple jobs. So I started today, not knowing if I was going to have any work this week, yeah. Monday through Friday. And that the first year I did this, it, that was like the end of the world. Like if I didn't have any work this upcoming week, I'm like, this isn't working. Yeah. Like I, I need a job at McDonald's or something. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. But now I look at Monday through Friday now and I'm like, all right, there's no work coming up. So uh, I'm going to sort these things out on the truck. I'm going to sort the things out on the center. I'm going to work on some music. And, and I get excited about those things. I'm like, all right, because when it's busy, when the laser stuff is busy and I'm grinding, 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 I'm a one-man operation. Yep. So a full two weeks might go by and I'm like, I wish I had a second to breathe so I could work on some music or the podcast. Yeah. And so so it's, it's I'm never content and I'll always complain about something, even to, in my head. I'm like, oh man, like this is five or six years of doing Night Laser. I wish it was busy. I wish I was making the money I could be making doing it. But then when I think about it some more, I'm like, well, then I wouldn't have the podcast. I wouldn't be doing these other things. And, and that's and, the thing. <laughs> yeah. And how you delegate your time. But it, it, you're right. Like self-reflection is a big thing. It's huge. And so, yeah. Um, and, and being your own worst critic is often something that people who are creative and talented and, and successful, I think they, they, they possess those things because um, the minimum is not enough. You know, like yep. doing, I suffer from that for sure. And, um, and not, you know, and I don't know if that's a, genetic dna thing if it's a program thing if it's a societal thing i don't i don't know what the case is but um having that drive though that does like just you know go 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 to you run out of gas and then try to figure out where the next stop is like yeah that is something that not i think most people don't possess and 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 a lot of people don't want to be in those situations but i can guarantee you there's a lot of people who probably follow you online that go man, I wish I had a day to work on music, man. I wish I had a day to work in my car, whatever. Like, so, yeah. um, and, and that's not wrong to, for people to be envious. It's not wrong for you to be like, Oh, I wish I had this. You know, I think that's just that that's the human element. And it helps you set goals. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, for li- sure. Li- like I said before, life is a series of challenges, but it's just kind of navigating and figuring out which challenges you want to take on. The things, the things that I try to tell myself a lot is, uh, whether or not it was me when I was 18, me when I was 25 when I was riding professionally, didn't have two nickels to rub together, but I was I was making enough money to pay my bills and be on the road with a bike. I mean, I was like the dream. Yeah. So I, I always but but then I would look at like my finances back. Like, I don't have I don't have any money. I've got like two hundred dollars in the bank. I'm flying to California for three months, expense paid all winter long, but I don't have any money. So I used to complain about not having any money. And then I would I'd take a step back and then I would think, Yeah, well, this eighteen year old kid that's like building houses and, and making a bunch of money or something would probably kill to be like, just be on the road. Absolutely. So I always tried to like put things into perspective in that light where I might think now at 35, there's so many things that I wish I had done sooner or had worked harder on. But then you take a step back and you're like, you're probably same with you. You're probably living a life that someone else is dreaming of and, or, or working hard to get to where you're at. Yeah. And it helps me take a deep breath realign and and focus again and, and rather than let my brain kind of bounce around and 
and freak out and uh, for sure and it makes you thankful what for what you have exactly um, yeah yep because who wants to live a life of regret and who wants to live a life of wishing i had y- yeah whatever. i mean you know that, that that's a it's a long drain down that empty wishing well it, it, yeah it um, is and it's actually sad it, it makes me sad when i think of myself in that like rhetorical situation, Mm -hmm. you know, where I'm like, what if I didn't do this or do that? I almost like put myself in that mindset and feel those feelings, like almost like in a real way. And that almost helps me like build more confidence into doing things that I want to do. And, you know, you make calculated risks, obviously, but, um, but that, but that's what I kind of wanted to talk about with the barbershop was, was that, like when you decided to start a shop, was that one of those like leap of faith type movements or was it just like the next step? Uh, no, was, I mean, it was definitely a leap of faith, but it wasn't, I always say the luckies was, uh, born out of, um, necessity, not want. Yeah. I worked at a shop for about eight years and the last two years I had sub leased the barbershop from the owner and was running it. And, um, at the tail end of 2007, um, he wanted to open a a school, a barber school, and had bought a piece of property that um, ultimately at the time was not going to be able to be utilized for that purpose because yeah. it was just, it, you know, it needed so much work. And um, so the next plan on, you know, on, on, on his journey and his, you know, was, well, I have a, I have a place where there's a barbershop. I could just change that into a school. Um, and so when he informed me that that hey i want to come back i want to like i want to turn this into a, a school my at that point i was i my, my world was flip side down upside down because yeah. i was i was doing what i loved and i was able to make a living that made me happy and i was doing things i enjoyed and i really liked that role um but i had no interest of ever opening up or owning a shop and within a couple of days of dialogue and conversation, you know, it was made very clear to me that, um, that there was a, there was a spot for me in his plan with the school moving forward. But that wasn't back to like being a teenager, being a kid, that wasn't part of my plan. Right. Um, And so I I just, I, I, I didn't want to do it. And so, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but, we just weren't on the same page. So ultimately that, that led me to all of a sudden now be forced with, to make a decision for after being years and years of comfortable and doing something you enjoyed. Now, essentially my, my whole being was now changed. And so the way I looked at things were much different. So I, I had to make a decision. Do I want to stay on this path of this person's plan and do what they would like? And it wasn't say it was be a, be, a, be a bad thing. It just wasn't my dream. It wasn't yeah. my focus. Yep. It's not where I wanted to put my efforts in. Or what are my what are my other options? Well, I I back to you know thinking the way I had thought for a very long time is I didn't want to be. I didn't want to have to rely on somebody else to like to worry about um, the nature of 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 my not even success but of of my well being of my work of my anything and. I decided, well, the only way that I can control the situation where I never have to be in this kind of position again, where somebody else is making the decision of my livelihood and my life is to open a barbershop. And so that it it came to me very quickly. And so I was very upfront. And like I said, within, I want to say it was two, three days tops. We had had the the initial conversation. Hey, um, this is what I want to do but I'd like to be part of it the next day of, you know, going home, freaking out, like I'm losing sure. my mind <laughs> next day, cutting hair, freaking out in yeah. my head all day long, trying to keep composure conversation later that evening. Um, Hey, so did you have time to like, think about it? Yeah. I don't want to do this. Um, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Uh, I, me saying, I think you should rethink it. There's a lot of history and a lot of just a, a long lineage of, um, people that had gone through this barbershop for decades, you know, almost a hundred years at that point. And I was like, I think you should rethink it. And then to the third day of being like, so did you reconsider? And I said, no, I didn't, I didn't reconsider because that's not what I want to do to that night finding like an ad in the paper for an office space. 
and essentially leading up to opening my own barbershop. Now, how old are you at this point? Um, I was 20, 27. So probably uh, yeah. like ready to. Yeah. I mean, know. I get, so yeah, I was, you know, in many ways, I, I guess I was, I was prepared, um, mentally i was prepared um fine well no well i say financial i mean it's not anything i saved for right i had right, a 53 right. chevy coupe that i sold um so i could open up the barbershop um i that that's yeah um well I, well i mean we <laughs> we haven't talked about cars yeah. much, but yeah we're both so cut I, from that I, same I sold my I, I sold my 53 chevy that i mean i would have driven this thing to california back and not thought twice about it but i sold that so it gave me back to like it, it gave me a, a way a means to be able to do this um, well we've we've talked about that not that specific story but like i sold the 71 long wheelbase Mercedes to buy my first laser machine. Yeah. So I, I get it. it and <laughs> my old man said to me once, you know, and so this is the thing is that, and especially if, I, I don't know, like I didn't grow up with many things. We just, we weren't able to have things. So like I, I looked at other people and, and I guess in some ways was envious, but my mother would always try to like impart, like be thankful for what you have Yep. because even what little you have is more than others have. So as you get older, you realize those things. But in return, getting older, working hard, and like filling in a couple of those spots with like cool stuff is pretty neat too. It's fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I was like, oh man, I don't want to sell this car, whatever. And my old man was like, go, listen, you didn't have the car before. You worked hard. You bought the car. You had some good moments with it. And now you've got another set of challenges. So take that car, sell it, make somebody else happy take the money, put it into your next thing. Right, and that will and get then, you to the and next it's, step. It might not be a car, but it's a step in that right thing. It's right. doing something that gives you joy, makes you, and I go, I go, no, 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 but I don't want to sell the car because you're not listening. And you're like, yep. and so, you know, back to, yeah, I get it, okay. You're then, preaching years to the later, choir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know that feeling all too well. <laughs> so, yeah, but so essentially, like I said, so sold the car, opened the shop, and I, I, I guess I had um, been for many years, even especially the last couple of years, subleasing the shop, managing it, running it, cutting hair, doing those things. I was prepared for it, even though I didn't know it. And yeah. like I said, if, and if that didn't happen, if something hadn't changed on his horizon, on his plan and his goals in life that at the time ultimately changed his pr perspective and view on what he wanted to do, um, it's a domino effect and it changed mine. But if that hadn't happened, I very much well could be in the same place cutting hair. And you know what, honestly, maybe happy, I don't know. Um, yeah. But in return, owning a shop, and having that responsibility of, I mean, I, I tell, and it's expanded. I'm very fortunate as it's grown over the years, but I, I, I've made a promise to myself and to the barbers who work at the shop and the customers that they will never have to worry about on my watch being worried or concerned if they will have a job to show up for or if they will have a place to come get a haircut to because that, that feeling of desperation and loss and... Um, it, it it was um it was scary it was you know yeah. made me sick to my stomach and um that might seem like people might not understand or get that but when you're feeling comfortable in life and you have made a life for yourself whether it be through work or through friendships or relationships like and then the world is flipped upside down it's devastating yeah um so I've, I try to, and in, in by working all the time and, and trying to do these things, I'm trying to fulfill that uh, security um, to myself and to, um, to my, my people, you know? You know, it wasn't until I met you uh, and kind of learned more about like your, um, your passion towards like being a barber and the cutting hair that I didn't, even, I had never even, like I love the fact that it's, it's part of your DNA because even like anyone who follows you on Instagram or, or, and sees the videos that like, you know, you talking about, even if it's just a post, you know, in text, you're talking about how important it is for not just you and the barbers that you have at the shop, but the people coming to get a haircut. Like I'd never even thought of it in that light before. And I mean, other barbers, I'm sure share that because it is your passion. Cutting hair was never my passion. So it was, it was such an awesome exposure to that because i never thought of it before like, i'd go get a haircut i liked i liked your shop was the first like like v like traditional style shop or because that was right around the same time that i started cutting my hair mm -hmm. different i just always used to buzz cut my hair and just yeah. and did it myself yeah 
And once I started sitting in your chair, I, I like immediately got it. Cause I, I liked the idea of, I just liked the twenties and thirties through the fifties. I just liked that era. And I like the, I like the idea of like sitting in a barber chair and like, it's like an experience every time, even Definitely. if you're doing it once a week type deal. And I love how you've kind of encapsulated that and have been able to like, uh, convey that to people who don't speak the same language, you know, you know, it's funny. I, I, uh, and I don't even know if I looked at cutting hair um, that way at one point in time. And for some people, they may never understand that that what I was saying that the moment or the the fulfillment they get from work. Um, but barbering hits on all levels for me. But as I've grown older, I've I've, I've learned to realize that it embodies all those other elements we were talking about um, into the trade. You know, you have community you have friendships and build relationships and you have um, creativity and an artistic nature and a fulfillment and um, you can make a living and you can provide joy and happiness to people and it's so there, there's many elements to it and you can and for me somebody who felt like they didn't fit in most of their life and in many ways still doesn't i built this little like ecosystem i guess that felt comfortable to my nature but in return, one of the biggest eye openers is I've met people who I would have never met. Right. They didn't listen to the same music. They didn't care about skateboarding, they didn't, any of those things. But I, re, I realized that those are obviously life-changing, important things to me, but there, that there's other human elements out there that just because they didn't have the same um, you know, fondness or likeness for those things, that you can still have a conversation or if anything, you can even build these like lifelong relationships with people right and it it, it quick, quickly made me realize it, if made me feel, well in some ways more vulnerable but in some ways also more secure in the part that like it was nice to have conversations with people to relate to especially where you feel like you don't fit in or alone or you feel weird or you feel whatever the case may be and then you re meet other people who you might have just never even noticed or written off or just thought they were just average you know, people that wouldn't give you the time of day and you go like, that person might look different than me, but they're, they're living the same life as me in just a different way. And yep. if anything, like I said, that's a, a bigger picture, but it just goes to show you that like, um, that you can find solace in a lot of different things and a lot of different people. And for the barbershop, it opened up my eyes and exposed me to all sorts of different, different types of people um, and conversations and thoughts and ideas that I forever uh, am grateful for that I don't think... Um, college or book could have given me right and i'm not like yeah. said denoting those things right i just that's human experience that's that's hands-on like one-on-one -on -one, a conversation like that people share and learning and listening and asking questions yep. um and i'm a constant student of I, I i guess of that part of life that i get through the barbershop that never gets old but in return i i i have felt a um a responsibility to the customers and the barbers, but also to my community to provide, um, I guess, like an example of, because through the barbershop, it, it's given me a lot of, I guess, abilities to do things um, that I didn't realize that the impact that they could have, for instance, like being able to, um, to be able to do, like we do fundraisers, like for the SBCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we talk about, um, a lot of things that you know we, we care about and a lot of like fundamentals and a lot of like um programs or movements or um different things uh there's you know and just even in concord like we have a big like um homeless resource center and we have a shelter and we have food pantries we have all these different things where um we've been able to give back and be part of things that just through what we already do on a daily basis for work Right. We realized it gave us the ability to help um, other people. And for me, I, I, I don't know if I realized that, I think as a young person and even early into my career, but after opening up the barbershop, I, I began to see the power uh, or the ability, I guess is the right word, to, to be able to reach and help other people that, that need help. That Whereas um, I, I f it makes me feel good yeah i mean that i mean and what a fulfilling feeling that is you know because you're still practicing your 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 art and your passion but yeah. now, now you're reaching so many people and changing people's lives and even on 
even on a day to day basis, you're, and I'm sure over since you've been doing it this long now, I'm sure you've actually, you've realized it yourself, but I'm sure you're a therapist in most ways to some people. You know, well, some people that come in and sit in the chair you, and like just, having somebody to listen to them, I'm sure helps significantly with what they might be dealing with. Definitely. You know? You're not wrong. And, uh, in many ways, sometimes I feel like I'm the one in the chair. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. I should, I should They're probably the be paying them <laughs> for dumping yeah. all my, yeah. dumping all my, my thoughts on them. But like, it, yeah. it, it is a reciprocal process. And oftentimes people will say things like that, like, Hey, thanks so much. Or wow. Or, you know, um, and most of the time it's pretty lighthearted, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, over my years, I've, 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 I've heard it all from the, the joyous times from the weddings and the births, um, the, the first house, but also to the divorce, the death, yep. the deceit, the betray, the losing the job, the financial woes, um, yep. and everything between. And oftentimes you hear it from these people before they tell their friends, family, loved ones, significant others. Oh, I can imagine. Um, yep. And so that's a powerful thing and that's a heavy thing. And it, it, I, I, I don't take it lightly. And I feel very um, fortunate in many ways that I, I guess I can be that for that person because I'm sure, I'm sure I've tested the waters and told people things without realizing just about how I was feeling. Yep. Um, and this year specifically 2020 obviously is a very difficult year for many reasons. Um, and we, we've, we've had those difficult conversations in the barbershop and we, we've um, everybody I think has, really done a great job at making people feel valued and comfortable. And I think we have a, a transparency at the barbershop that, you know, our, our big thing for us is, um, I guess we don't tolerate intolerance. Yeah. And so to make people feel welcome and to feel valued and to feel cared for and to feel like they matter and to have a place free of judgment, um, especially in this time period, if anything, I think, holds a lot of weight for people and this isn't like a gimmick this is just how this is how we live this is how we are because i think we see the world through a bit of a different lens than some people do in this world so you know we're, we were it's like for the people by the people um and so it made me realize that just because we might look different or listen to some different stuff that or think differently that there's a lot of other people out there that feel the same way um right that, you know that are cut from the same cloth so you know, it, it's 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 kind of a weird thing. It's like um, it's almost like a like a filter. You know, like nowadays online, you can filter the the things you're looking for, and so I, I think it's it's our it's word of mouth. Uh, oftentimes, that it's the haircut that got you through the door, but it's probably the conversation that keeps people coming back. Absolutely. Um, and so, I, I, you know, and we might not be the cup of tea for everybody too, but I think this day and age. You know, there's a lot of places to get good, good haircuts, but um, we're not going through the motions. And, you know, we'd like to have a good time, obviously, and joke and have oh, fun yeah. and oh, yeah. all that stuff. But it, 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 I think the barbershop, at least in my opinion, I think Lucky stands for um, a higher quality of uh, thinking as, as well that goes along with it. Because, you know, you can, get a good, you can get a good haircut and there might not be a lot of like substance behind right. the conversation. And yeah, but I think that, some people come to us for those reasons and that that makes me feel good in fact that makes me i mean i could bore you to death with about cutting hair but i would say when i lay my head down to sleep at night when i think about some of those conversations that i have with people that's more fulfilling than the actual um technique and art of cutting hair yeah i believe that yeah absolutely yeah because that that's far more important yeah i mean that's in yeah the grand scheme of things I mean, that's, I mean, and I'm, I'm one of them. I mean, you know, the drive, it's like a 45 minute drive. Oh, I thought about today. I said, but my GPS said it's 50, 50 minutes, I think to get to you. Yeah. And I said, man, that's so cool. Like, I mean, even if I, I thought it was like maybe a half hour and I was like, even a half hour was a long time, <laughs> Yeah. but I, I, I was, I was thankful and grateful and impressed by that thinking about all the exits and the roads and the signs and all the places you pass by and all the different things. The fact that. <laughs> you found your way down to us is really cool. Um, and, and I think you get back what you put out. So I think in many ways, me sitting on this couch is, you know, like you said, 10 years ago, or however long yeah. when we came in the shop. It's, um, there's something that, that, you know, brings you together and brings, brought us together. Yeah, so I, absolutely. I think, I think that's pretty powerful and I, I'm very fortunate for that. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and as am I, I mean, that's it. it yeah. It's been, yeah, it's been 10 years 
this year because I went down there. Uh, I was dating a girl in Concord and who, boy, I can't remember if it was a girl that you were dating for a while, had a salon yeah. right up behind yep. your, okay. Yep. So that's, so my ex-girlfriend was, she got her hair done. Oh, her, okay, cool. And we were going to, um, I've mentioned him before we started recording, but my friend Josh, who has the Revival Motoring Podcast, uh, it's like an automotive-based podcast, him and all of his, at the time, roommates were having like a 1930s Prohibition era New Year's Eve party. Yeah. And Joanna and I, my girlfriend at the time, were going down there. And this was around the time where I was, uh, I, I either grew my hair way out or I was always just shaving my head. I just, ne I never went and got a haircut. And, um, I wanted to get like a proper looking haircut for this New Year's Eve party because we were all going to be like, you know, skinny black tie, kind of yeah. suited up. And so Joanna mentioned you. She's like, oh, like the girl that cuts my hair, uh, her boyfriend or whoever, like, yeah. or, or it might have even been that it was the same building. I think yeah. there's a barbershop it, in the front yeah, of the yeah. building. And, uh, and I remember her telling me the name of it. I was like, what's the name? She's like, I don't know. I think it's called Lucky's or something. And that's, that was the first thing I went, I just drove down on a whim, had, yeah, I was like by myself. And I was like, this is like far too far of a drive to just get my hair cut. And from there on out, Look, I was going down like dude, every, so <laughs> at least once a month, if not every other week, to get a haircut. So I, I remember, and I don't know if it was the first haircut, but I definitely remember an early haircut of yours. And in fact, <laughs> this has this has stuck with me to this day. I know where you're going with this. And uh, I will never forget. And, and I, I, I actually think about this almost weekly because I had somebody I had somebody that reminded me of, a, of an earlier version oh, of John. I, I you, tell this story, dude. You, I know where you're going because I tell this story. So it's it right at the time where like, like hard parts Parts, razor parts started coming into play yeah and i can't remember if i had done any or not it was early early into I, the game of it. i know there was a couple guys you had working there that yeah. they did their first razor part on me dude <laughs> so you know so the first time like uh oh, seeing no. this new iteration of a razor part because you know you had different things like um razor parts everything especially like um you, you know like um 60s from soul music to like uh, early reggae and ska, right, like cutting right. in parts to, yep. um, you know, like we were saying, like do like like Eric B and like like to like yeah, Gumby's like to the, double like like a, a NBA like, players like half step that. in like different yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so like there's always been like you know designs and cutouts and parts put in but this was taking you know essentially a classic <laughs> cut and yeah. really like modernizing it and making it more drastic more more defined more hard yeah and dude so you. You, you, I remember you asked for this, this part I said, Hey, do you think we could cut that in? And, uh, I was like, I mean, we can, yeah, that, I mean, that's an option. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to do. Okay. Um, you know, so my, my first instinct is to, uh, uh, well, it was probably at the time not to do it, but in my head, I was like, well, this is, you know, this is what the customer wants. So that's what matters. <laughs> yeah. So seriously. I get, you know, I get the hair. It's all dialed in haircuts looking fresh. We got the parts and that's a nat natural part. Throw some pomade, get it slicked over, and so take the T edges, the the detail clipper, and cut it in to the point where it looked crisp and clean. But where you know you go like you can't tell it's like a cut in part, and you go, man, yeah, that looks cool. Do you think we go a little bit bigger? And I go, oh, what do you mean? And you're like, yeah, like just like a little wider. <laughs> and I go, oh, like like wider. And you go, like, yeah, like wider. And I go. I mean, we can, and you go, yeah, that'd be cool. And I go, okay. <laughs> so like, dude, like, you know, a fraction of a fraction of an eighth of an inch, <laughs> dude, like go in like a millimeter more and you go, um, uh, you think we go a little more? So dude, I think we're at like the fourth or fifth, a little bit more. <laughs> and so now I'm like, I, I've got this thing dipped into your head. And in my head, I'm like, yo, this is wild. <laughs> and I'll never forget these words that you said to me. Yeah. You dude, you yeah. looked at me and you had this smile on your face, dude, like ear to ear, like eyes, like gleaming. And you said, yo, I want to see this thing from space. <laughs> and I, dude, I literally almost dropped my clippers and walked out of the door. I like you, like, dude, you wanted to Google earth your haircut. And I, to this day, have never forgot that because I had a Google earth, like hard part last <laughs> week. <laughs> dude. And I was like, same thing. I was like, dude, like going through like. I was having like PTSD, like, dude, like, <laughs> like, like, like thinking about the first time, like yeah. I like opened up like your uh. skull with this thing, dude. And I just remember thinking like, dude, I could put like a matchbox car in there. Uh. Like, 
And the whole time, like, I was like, this is such a fresh cut. Yeah. But I was kind of like, yo, like, if oh. anybody asks you, don't don't tell them where you got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And, like, oh. and, you know, but I'm but crying. that was at the time, dude. But it, it was cool because within oh. that time period, it was something that changed dynamically in the barbering trade and profession. And we ended up seeing a lot for, oh, I mean, we still I, do, but, like, there was, you know, yeah. there was a period of time. and. <laughs> But dude, that that seeing your part from space thing, <laughs> it, it has it has never left me, professionally, it's, or, or it's, emotionally. emotionally. <laughs> and, uh, and dude, like I said last week, I had a cat, and he literally said to me, "Go big or go home." <laughs> and I was like, "Are you asking? My man. Do I have My an option? Man. Like, is that like?" And dude, so I I same thing, dude. I played it safe, oh, and then after the man. fifth time, I was just like, okay. And he goes, oh. yeah, yeah, that's cool. And then he goes, and so he went to leave. He pulls out his phone and pulls up Google Earth. Dude, and he goes, all right, so yeah, uh, so this is cool, but for next time, maybe we'll go bigger, dude. Oh. And so I was like, oh, I bet he doesn't come back in. He came back in, a sportsman shop, and this is last week. And same thing, dude. So I started as big or bigger than we left last <laughs> yeah. time. And he was like, I didn't realize, dude, that was just like dipping like my toe in the door. Like oh. he was like, yo, open this bad boy up. And <laughs> And to the point, like, where we reconfigured his entire, like, it was, oh my this is, dude, I'm like a hair surgeon. And hey, like, so, so, but was it wider than what I wanted 10 years it, ago? It, it, <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> that's the question. It was, it, it, it was probably, it was, it was not wider. It was as wide. Oh, okay. As, I mean, we're talking definitely full pinky and I've got pretty good size hands. Um, so like, uh, cause I was like, he said something. I was like, yo, like your pinkies are my pinkies. Cause I've got like pretty wide. Yeah. And he's like, let me see. And I was like, and I had gloves on. So of course my pinky looked bigger with a glove on. And he's like, yeah, oh. yeah. Like yours. And I was like, oh, wow. dude, here we go. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still working through this, but, oh, uh, man, but dude, yeah, the, the, the space thing has never left. And, um, oh. and so for many ways I'm, 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 I'm thankful oh, for, I was, I was, oh, I was <laughs> for, you know, leading me into that. But, um, oh, I was crying laughing. Dude, I, I remember, and your eyes were so wide open. You were, I loved were, it. And, oh, you were stoked. I loved it. You were stoked, and <laughs> everybody looked at each other. And in fact, they probably looked at me and were like, yo, what did you do? And I'm like, no, 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 that's like what the customer wants. That's what we're here for. And then we just hadn't seen anything like that bold. Yep. But like, dude, it was, I mean, it was brazen, and was, it was loud, and it was... It was paving the way. <laughs> yeah, dude. So like... Dude, I've got a photo. So this was before, this was before a show in Princeton, New Jersey. A lot of people listening know the show. It's called First Class Fitment. And uh, it's like a curated car show at a private airport in Princeton, New Jersey. So it's like a super high-end, like super nice car show. And I had my 1960 Mercedes, that brown one. Yeah. And I was taking that down there. <clears throat> and I had a mustache at the time. And I wore the mustache and the hard part with as much confidence as you could. Well, to the point uh, where it made people like... Whoa, okay. I kind of want one. <laughs> oh, dude, and I'm sure and, you, you were probably wearing those driving gloves you had yep. too, dude. I've got a photo of me. Knuckles out, dude, hard part ripping. Dude, yeah, <laughs> just yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't have my phone. Oh, oh. i got to show you. I've got a photo. I've got a photo of me at that show. At that show, getting out of the Mercedes with the driving gloves on. <clears throat> a skinny black tie yep. with a double-breasted cardigan over me. All business. And it was a fall show. And I... And to this day, I still reshare that photo on Instagram, and I'm gonna have to again since we're talking about it Break here. Break the internet. And and I still, yeah, I've got a photo of the Googled Earth, <laughs> Google <laughs> Earth hard part, uh, dude. That's it right there. Yo, so from afar, it doesn't look bad, does it? It looks great. See, I get. I wasn't gonna like be too like conceited about it, but I get compliments about that haircut all the it time. It was a great haircut. Even, you, though you you wore well. even though you, you were mortified, even though you were mortified, dude, it was just it, it was it was and it, it, it's, it, it's a confidence thing. Though. No, it's great. And, it's and, a confidence thing. Like you gotta, you I couldn't wear that hard part and go out in public. No, and be like you have to, ex look you have to exude the right, the right amount of attitude for this. I literally, because, dude, I kid you not. So after this weekend, same cut. I flew to California. Yeah, and I was with a, I stayed with a buddy of mine. His name is Matt Crook. And yep. he owns a wheel company called Fifteen Fifty Two. Yep. And we we're in his shop, and he's got uh, a Mercedes race car, like a Mercedes 190E race car. Yep. And I was helping him work on it. And I was laying underneath, cutting, I was cutting, <laughs> like, I had like a cutting wheel, and I was cutting like some like suspension bracket 
off because we were changing the suspension and this like bracket had to go. And he took a photo. I was like laying under the car and he took a photo, <laughs> he took a photo of me just working on the car, right? And I shared the photo and it's me in a white t-shirt, like 1950s looking in a white t-shirt laying under this 80s car. Yeah cutting you know using this cutting wheel and and this dude i'll never forget it commented on the i shared the photo on instagram and he goes yo did you use that same cutting wheel to cut that hard part because <laughs> all you could so see good. all you could see was like that part of my head oh yeah and he literally was like yo did you use that to cut your hair too I and that. i was like oh my gosh i love that, that killed me but as you can see i don't have uh yeah it's all natural now that I'm, was a time yeah and it's yeah it, but it's cool because that was i lived it it's okay because people always go like <laughs> you know like what's what's the new thing what's coming out next and i go like oh i, I don't know like um you know we're, we're very creative but I, <laughs> yeah. i'm not ba back to like here's the thing there's a lot of like cool stuff like wild stuff like just crazy looking stuff and a lot of barbers and people put that out there and it's cool to see you're creative and artistic that way but the thing that a lot of people don't realize or remember, whether it be cars or whether it be like through haircuts, is that like, um, and you, obviously on the internet, you can paint a picture of whatever you want, but right. not everybody is getting, um, you, you know, like half bleach, half pink, half, you know, designs and this and that. And like, and it, that stuff is really cool and all, but at the end of the day, and same thing, right? Like you put, you get back what you put out. So like maybe if you're doing stuff like this and people see it, they go, cool, I want to try that. I want that. Come, They'll come to you and get it. But at the same time is, Back to like, I'm the type of person as, as somebody who wants to make a living the rest of my life and being a people pleaser, nor does it bother me. I want to give you what you want. So right. that, that fulfills me. <clears throat> yep. um, and uh, so b you have to figure out how, how or maybe you shouldn't have to, but I also don't, the, to me, it's not like scrutinous or, or, or monotonous of doing these different things. I like doing all the different types of haircuts because it's the conversation essentially, like I said, also that sets people apart from each other right but you have to be able to or at least in my opinion um for a long successful career and like and not just like hopping on any trend like you have to be able to like curate yourself to appropriately offer service to all walks of life yeah or at least i want to yeah i don't want to only like have one type of haircut define me you know right yeah exactly um and so like i said there's nothing wrong with but people sometimes put things out there like um you know, not every car is airbagged. Not every haircut has a hardcore. Not every, and so, <laughs> yeah. and as, as cool as those things are, and as much as you enjoy doing them, or it's nice, or maybe it garners more attention. Um, living in the scope of the world, at least like in my trade, uh, I want to be uh, proficient at being able to fill in the blanks and give people what they want, no matter what it is. Yeah, and be versatile. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't want to be a one-trick pony. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't think that has. Not only I don't think it has a longevity to it. But I also don't want to just do one thing or be known for just one yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, and, and you'd get bored at that point too. Definitely. I mean, I'm the same way. It's like, I th that's why I like so many weird different cars. It's like, it's, 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 and, and it's almost in the same way. If I was building cars for people, I'm sure, yeah, like your haircuts, someone would be like, I want like it done. Like, and you're like, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's you funny. Know? Yeah. For, for many years, you know, people, I guess, associate us with doing just these clean classic haircuts. Right. And, um, but I've always said like, you know, I don't care what hair is attached to, who's wearing it. Well, I've been what, in there like, enough over the years now. I mean, I saw a decade of going in there. I mean, I've been in there a bunch where I've seen somebody, uh, boy or girl, with like long hair yeah. and get like a cut where the hair stays long. It doesn't, it doesn't get some high fade. And we, and we love that stuff. And yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. I pay attention to that. Yeah. If I see them, like, if they're like in a chair behind me and I'll, I'll just like watch in the mirror the whole time because I'm like, this is awesome. I don't see. Sure. Every Because yeah, more often than not, it's some younger guy or even an old timer getting a getting a crew cut yeah. flat top or a high fade or something. Sure. Um, so it's, yeah, it's cool to see, to see that. Um, especially someone who's got like, someone who's got like a completely different makeup of hair, you oh, know, like, like super curly mm -hmm. or like naturally, like yeah, like real tight and curly or something. It, it's great. We love it all. Like there's, there's nothing I don't want to do. Like there's nothing you could throw at me that like, I wouldn't like, Hey, for you at this first. point, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and I, 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 yeah. And I it'd be like super that. intimidating for me. Cause I've never cut hair. I'd be like, I don't know what to do with hair like that. Mm -hmm. That'd be so crazy. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of that comes with time, but I've also just sure. like, I, I guess like you said, like when you picked up a base, I mean, I don't know anything about arpeggios and all this different stuff you're talking about. I mean, I know like, you know, I'm yeah, aware yeah, of what yeah. they are, but some people, they just, they can read the language. They can see it. They can like, you know, uh, right. Objectively, you can look at something and see it, hear it, feel it. And you know, like how 
like you're going to build um, like the diagram in your head to get from like point A to point B. Right. And not everybody yep. has that. Um, and not everybody goes the same no, you're, way yeah, to absolutely, get there. For yeah. sure. Even yeah. within our own shop, like you can get a good haircut in your chair. You can get a very similar look in different. Oh, everybody chair. cuts my hair but, different in there. For yeah. Sure. And that, yeah. that's what's kind of cool too. Like, and, and I was saying earlier about like surrounding yourself, you know, with people, um, you, you know, essentially, I, I think the idea of like, you don't want to like clone yourself or I guess it's kind of come full circle. Right. But like, I find if you, if you surround yourself with people you admire or respect or appreciate, um, they have so much to offer. So I, I know for me as a business owner and as a barber and as a human surrounding myself with different types of people who embody different things that I appreciate that may be even ultimately far varying and wide, widely different than myself. I've really come to like appreciate those things, even when they felt uncomfortable or different. Um, yep. And so I think that's how you learn and how you grow, like, you know, um, and, and you have that constant, so both sides of the chair, so you're surrounded by people on a day-to-day -day basis that you can not only tolerate, but appreciate. And then in return in the chair, you have so many different walks of life of, you know, uh, and, and, and it's great, it's it's never the same thing over and over. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and I've had people say like, oh, do you ever get bored of this? And, you know, 20 years in, I, it's no lie. I mean, if you've ever come to the shop, you, you can tell that we, you know, really enjoy it. Um, and it's, if I, if I didn't, I wouldn't do it. You exactly. know, like just the type yeah, of person yeah, yeah. I am. Like yep. no one's same. No, yeah. My hand has never been forced with anything in life. Like I won't, I'm not, you know, like I said, not, it's not a, a tough thing or it's not a cool thing. Like, but it's your life. You need to do what makes you happy. And I know that's not always easy no to like hardly you know, ever like, is but it is your life and you really like I, I and i fully support and i want people to feel empowered to do the things that make them happy and i know the older you get the more difficult it is but it's not fair to yourself and ultimately it's not fair to the people around you if you're not happy because then how can you provide that like that that support and that care to other people if you're not giving it to yourself you know um yeah but it's it's you know it's um it's a, it's a weird thing to like, when, when I think about, like I said, I've met so many people and learned so many things that I, I really couldn't have imagined that I would have ever got if it hadn't been for traveling or for music or for cutting hair. Um, and I don't know if people in the, like, you know, the nine to five office job, if they, if they get that kind of, um, that education, that kind of like evolution of their of their brain and their life and I, I don't i don't know yeah yeah it, and it's because we don't do that it's it's hard for me to think that as well um i think that's a great place to end on though yeah that's a that's a great that's a great uh kind of uh words of wisdom i mean it, i've gotten that response from a few different people i've had on who, who have pursued a life of passion for the most part you know like like started their own automotive shop or started a car show that's like ground them into the ground but it's like over the years it's they've been able to cultivate something that supports them but brings the community together in a way and and now they're like fulfilled and and i'll i'll hear from all sorts of friends being like man that like motivated me to like start thinking about what i really want to do and what so i i mean that's that's invaluable i think people that listen to podcasts i mean i'm one of them i want to listen to somebody who yeah like took the reins and said i'm gonna i'm gonna do something that i'm not gonna waste my life or i'm not gonna let my life pass me sure. by. i'm gonna go i'm gonna go do it and uh and do it to the best of my ability yeah keep your hands on the steering wheel because you're the one driving so yeah man and yeah i mean i mean so for people who don't know and I sent you a screenshot just, what was it, last night or two nights ago? My friend John from Florida, who said, I just oh, yeah. started following Lucky's because you've been because <laughs> you've been sharing his photos and stuff. And, and he's like, so he was looking forward to the podcast. He was like, you know, like, I'm excited to listen to it. But for people who don't know, um, your main, I say main, you've got two locations now, but uh, Lucky's Barbershop is on, is it South? Yep, 50 South State Street. State Street, yeah, yep. in Concord. Yep. And, um, and now you've got a location in Portsmouth, which I actually haven't, I knew when Ryan was in there. Yes. I'd been in there. That's right. Yeah. And then you were just had a couple of chairs in the back room. But I actually haven't been in there since you've taken over that whole yeah, unit. Yeah. It's um, cool. It looks awesome. In Thank photos. you. Yeah. It yeah. Looks that, great. That's in Portsmouth. That's 801 Islington Street. And it's, uh, they call it like the West End. It's the, I guess, uh, for lack of a better phrase, it's kind of up and coming area, sort of. It's more. awesome. You get your feet 
planted. Yeah, there now. you know, even even in just under four years, um, there's been so much growth and development in the community in that section of town where yep. um, a lot of a lot of people are really like they're they're flocking to and moving to, and businesses are flourishing. And that's great. Um, you know, and I think that just like this, whether it be cars or cutting hair or wherever it is, you, you need to find your community, and it's out there. You know, yep. it's it's no matter how alone you feel, there's someone else out there that 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 thinks and feels the same way you do. So. You know, you'll, you'll find it. You'll find them eventually. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Concord in Portsmouth, uh, Lucky's Barbershop on Instagram. Yep. That's it, right? Just Lucky's Barbershop? That's, That's what I thought. I think so. One one word. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, you're pretty active there. So you posting. Now that you got two locations, you got enough content to keep that thing. I tr- you know, on. it's, yeah, it's another vehicle, I guess. It's it's a weird thing. Um, well, but, what's up with, did you kind of put your podcast on the back burner or you kind of just, was that just kind of like a one and one trip and done kind of thing? Well, I, I, this is, I guess, technology that I'm, I've been trying to learn and work on and back to surrounding yourself with people who are, um, a lot of the, a lot of the people at the shop are, are pretty well, well versed in a lot of technology. So I've come, right. I've come a long way even yeah. from over, you know, uh, never owning a computer to, um, the first decade of, I guess, owning a business or even what's that, you know, 17, 18 years into barbering, not having a website. To, right. Right. Uh, having social media and Instagram, but it, it is a way to communicate with other people. And we're like I said, we're, we're fully transparent. And so, you know, if you like cool cuts, like it's, it's cool to check that out. But also um, if you kind of want to see sort of how we hear and how we feel and that we're, you know, we're, we're right there with the people we're, we're, you know, we're, we're right aligned with, um, we, we want to be in this kind of world moving forward. We want to align ourselves with other like-minded people who really are, um, you know, are outspoken, um, and empathetic and compassionate about the things they care about. And if that means, you know, respecting others and sticking up for people that need help and, um, you know, really wanting to, um, try to, I guess help identify injustices and work on yourself. It's 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 a great tool to be able to connect with whatever it is you're into. But um, this day and age, where uh, during this pandemic, where obviously we have all been living in a time where you can't communicate the way you used to with other people, and you can't um, be as close in proximity with people, we've all learned that like there's a there's a deficit there, and um, I think through these times of struggle, um, through the pandemic and, um, through black lives matter and through pride and through, um, you know, senseless police brutality. I think a lot of people are really using these, um, outlets as uh, a way to communicate and to try to like express how people feel. And I think it may not be, um, for everybody, but, in the barbershop, like I said, we're all very genuine people who not only love and care about what we do for work, but we care about the people that sit in the chairs. And I'd say a lot of people identify with the same thoughts that we do. And, um, and I think it is good to, to grow and to learn and to listen to people with different ideas than you. But um, we have utilized things like Instagram to convey our messages, to let people know that they are safe and they are welcome at all times at the shop. So that's that will always be important to me. So. Yeah, and you guys do a good job of, of simply by leading by example. You know, like if somebody comes in and, and they sit in anybody's chair, just the, yeah, being treated with respect. And yeah, yeah, I think, I think I mean, because I'm, I mean, I've, I've seen you go through, I, mean, I think James might have been there in 2010. Maybe, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, we, we've definitely, the, the barbershop has evolved um, right, but I'm just saying, like, I, I, even from day one, I can't remember if, if you're the last standing person that's that was there in 2010. That's still there now. Yeah, but but it's like it's 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 always you've always kind of kept like, even if it's somebody's only only been there for like a short time, it's like the, it's, there's always been the same uh, atmosphere. Yeah, and in I, there, and which I is want good. people to feel from the first time they walk into the shop that they have as much. Um, right and privileged as somebody who's been coming in for 10 years or longer because right. yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that, that says a lot about the way you treat people, but also the way you run a business um, is you have to take care of people because essentially those people take care of you. Yep. It doesn't matter how good you are at whatever trade it may be. If you're not genuine and you're not honest and you're not, um, 
I guess, a decent person. You don't treat people with respect and care. Ultimately, those people are going to stop coming oh, yeah. back to you. You know yeah. what I mean? And people work hard for a living. And so when they come into your business, you want to make them feel like they're important, they're special. But like I said, in a, in a very caring um, way so that like we're no better than anybody else. So you come to us like you like we need you more than you need us right right and so yep. that that yep. that attitude will always be there it's so, a good attitude to have yeah yeah so we're we're very thankful and we're very appreciative and uh the barbershop has given me more than i could have ever ever imagined well that's awesome man i mean so, and that's and that's inspirational to not just me but i'm sure to a lot of people that that not only hear this but listen to you talk about that you know i mean that's that's great i appreciate it very much i appreciate you being here man thanks brother hey I'm, I'm glad we did this. I'm, Thank you. We'll, we'll this is have, good. We'll have to do it again for sure. And uh, whether or not it's here or in one of the shops or, yeah, we'll have to do it again for sure. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thanks, John. Thanks, Josh. See you guys. Thanks, brother. Yeah, man, that was appreciate awesome. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, I'm stoked you brought up the, the haircut. I totally forgot dude, about I, that. Yeah. That, that was that was a perfect I was literally thinking of you last week this dude was like I was like oh man this is <laughs> dude having flashbacks <laughs>